So hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, thank you. So welcome everyone to our second uh, international workshop on agricultural vision. And uh, we are recording this event. So uh, we will be sharing this uh, uh, to YouTube after we finish the event. So first, uh, thanks everyone for attending uh, this uh, second workshop. And we hosted it last year at the CVPR and uh, it was the first edition of uh, Agriculture Plus Computer Vision and AI, and it was uh, very well received. So we are hosting again with uh, some of the returning guests. And uh, before we start, we want to thank the, uh, our sponsors, uh, Intellier, uh, Indigo Ag, uh, University of Illinois and Oregon, and uh, Microsoft. And also thanks to a lot of our co-organizers to make this happen. And the workshop is organized mainly by uh, the sponsorships from Intelling Air uh, and uh, Naira, who is the chief scientist of uh, Intelling Air and also a professor at uh, UIUC, and uh, Jennifer, who is the director of uh, Machine Learning and uh, uh, Intelling Air, and also a lot of other collaborators to co-organize this. And uh, also we want to thank several students uh, in my lab that spend uh, uh, numerous effort to really to help organize the prize challenge and they have been working a lot behind the scene to run the challenge, to verify the results and to prepare the submission, et cetera. So thanks to everyone on the organizing committee. And this year, we're going to have a, a, a spectacular lines of speakers. As you can see here, so we have uh, uh, invited the speakers from both industry and, and academia. And uh, we have a panelist from different sectors as well. And uh, this includes uh, uh, talks from leading companies like Microsoft and Google. They have been spending efforts on uh, agriculture plus AI and also more traditional companies like Indigo Egg and uh, John Deere who are uh, working on pushing the efforts from different uh, uh, like perspective like robotics and uh, uh, computer vision, et cetera. Also, we include uh, uh, two of the invited talks uh, about uh, the NSF AI Institute, which are recently founded to uh, in collaboration with the USDA to sponsor research in agriculture plus AI. And we have uh, all the invited talks available and uh, sent to uh, the participants. So I hope that uh, most of you have already watched these uh, wonderful talks. And uh, if you have questions, we do have the links for submitting questions uh, online, or when you are participating, feel free to type in the chat. We will pick up additional questions as well. And uh, for the price challenge, I'll, I'll do a very brief uh, overview here, but uh, later uh, Kai Wang will introduce and, uh, uh, in more detail. So we have uh, two tracks this year. So it's expanded and uh, we have a, a, a bigger price compared to last year to encourage more participation. And uh, we have a more data set. We have enabled uh, eight different patterns compared to six patterns last year. And uh, we are expanding this to both the supervised track and the semi super track. And also for the data formats, we are giving more information regarding the geolocation, et cetera. So this enables uh, some of the unique solutions this year. And uh, we will be, um, an, we will be uh, giving the awards after the workshop. So for the winners, please contact the organizers and uh, we will talk about details about that. Thanks for everyone participating here. And uh, we also have a paper track. So we have uh, accepted uh, uh, six wonderful topics here. And uh, we have also uploaded the talks online and they are from different locations of the world to addressing different uh, agricultural problems. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to uh, uh, raise questions here uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, or uh, you can still uh, follow up on the YouTube with the comments and the authors will address those questions later. And so finally, the workshop schedule here. So uh, we have this very brief opening remarks, and then we will have about 50 minutes for a price challenge summary and the presentations for the winning solutions. And then we will have a Q&A se uh, sessions for the price challenge and the workshop papers. And after that, we will have the invited speaker session where we have a Q&A sessions for invited talks. It will be around 30 minutes, starting from 10 o'clock uh, in about one hour. And then we will have another hour for panel discussion where it will be hosted by Professor Naira here. 
And so uh, without further ado, uh, we will start the uh, price challenger summary and presentation uh, session. So Kai, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Thank Great. you, please, Professor. Yeah, please share your screen. Thanks. Um, can I see my screen? Yes. To share the video together. All right, so let me briefly introduce the price challenges this so year. So, Kai, you are in the presentation mode. Maybe you can switch to the regular mode for your presentation. You mean we can we can see like multiple slides. I mean, you are in the presenter view. Yeah, so how about now? Uh, still the same. I think if you go up to the presentation uh, view on that previous panel, you can see where Ches uh, shared the slides properly. You're using two monitors, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's also part of the problem with Zoom. Go back to where you were, the other mode. Yeah, it looks like it's one underneath this one. Whoops. Yeah, now it works, thanks. Thank you, Ed. Yep. Okay, so uh, for the price challenges this year, we have two different tracks. One is a supervised track and uh, different from last, last year's uh, competition. We also have the semi-supervised track, which not only provide the supervised data set, but also we provide the raw image data set. So for the image data set we use is the agricultural vision data set. This year we provide all the data in this data set for, for our competition. So it consists of over 56,000 uh, trend uh, images and over 18,000 validation images and over 19,000 test images. Each of these images is a 512 by 512 RGB image and uh, we also provide the near infrared image for each of these images. As you can show on the right side, there are eight different patterns we need to recognize in these images. Also, we provide the additional boundary map and masks to help the participants, participants to identify the, uh, the patterns and the boundary of the image. So, so there are nine different classes we evaluated during the competition, uh, including these eight different strategies and the background. So for this year's challenge, there are over 28 teams participated in the supervised track with over 240 submissions and eight teams participated in the semi-supervised track with over 60 submissions. Uh, as you can see on the right, there are two different uh, tracks for this year's competition. And uh, next, uh, we have the initial ranking right now, and we are still reproducing the uh, final, final ranking. So as you can see for the supervised track, the top five teams are team AI Earth, team, team WRL, Team SCG Vision, Team AI Innovation, and Team AI CSNTU. And for the semi-supervised track, uh, the top five teams right now is AI Earth, uh, WRL, SCG Vision, Bingo Wing, and Team AI Innovation. So today we have the fortune to invite the 
top three teams to do to do some presentations. So the coming next up will be the presentations of these top three teams. So. So firstly, let's watch the presentation from Team AI Earth. The first thing to introduce the methods of supervised track, great contention for agriculture semantic sanitation. We will introduce some methods at following. We found this dataset had two main issues with texture and cross domain. For which texture agricultural annotation labels is relative concept, and some foreground region is similar to background. For cross domain, different phenomenal phrases such as seeding stage and grouping stage, which cross region with similar color and texture may annotate with diff different labels. To overcome these issues, we first propose the team if normalization to emphasize foreground regions and surprise background. We group images on the same field. Then we normalize images by mean and range on the same field. We call this TIFF normalization. Then we propose the grid contamination. Some categories like dry down are easily confused with background. Meanwhile, annotations of foreground and background is relative. In order to introduce the more background regions, we sample nine images from the same field and put these images into a three multiply three grid. We call it grid contamination. We think this is very critical. In addition, we randomly flip and rotate sample the image. The train pipeline is shown in the figure. More details are shown in the table. This is a detailed description of the ablation study. Finally, we get 56.8 on the test site. Next, we show our methods on semi-supervised track. Semi-supervised semantic sanitation by cross-validation. We first process the unlabeled data according to the following formula. Raw data is converted to uint8 format. At the same time, the image is cropped to 512 wide images, and there is no overlap between each image. The process image is shown in the figure. As shown in our grocery, we first optimize the teacher model on the labeled image by cross validation. Then, use the teacher models to generate hard pseudo labels for unlabeled images with a threshold. The regions with confidence less than a threshold are set as ignore labels. We select the validated data and from semi site. At last, we fine-tune each model with all labeled dataset and semi site. As shown in the figure, the methods of cross-validation is to divide the dataset into five folders. The reason 
Why we use cross validation to generate pseudo labels is that a single model is easy to overfit some categories. So we can get more reliable confidence through cross validation. In order to generate pseudo labels, a reasonable threshold can be set. Here we set 0 0.9. More details are shown in the table. Model size also meets the requirement. OK, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Qing Hui Liu. Today, I'm going to present our models. Right, our so Netherlands. we will have the question session for the first presenter. Yeah, so I think the author is also here. Uh, hi, Shang Liu, are you here? Yeah, I'm here, and my partner is also here, Ben Jianlong. Yeah, hi, welcome to the workshop. So do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so I collect some questions online. So for from your from your report, you mentioned that you treat the problem as a defect detection problem. So what's the difference between the defect detection and the normal semantic segmentation problems? I mean, what makes you uh, choose to treat it as a defect def detection problem for this computation. Uh, okay. Um, for the defect problem, uh, the more important thing is uh, how to how to identify the background because it's put you put background other regions is also is all all, all is the foreground. Uh, in the agricultural semantic challenge, uh, we said that, that the most uh, foreground class is misclassified as background. So we, um, so we, we, um, and uh, okay, sorry, I'm a little nervous. I need to think of this detail. Uh, it's okay. Hmm. Okay, um, so, so, okay, like, uh, you, know, you, you, you can, you can help me to explain it more detail. Hi, so, uh, Najimo, uh, I saw you have some questions for the team AIRs. Okay. Hi, uh, yeah, I had uh, one question. So, uh, hi, congratulations, team AIRs, uh, on your um, achievements and uh, fantastic results. So, my question was that I'm very interested in your image grid technique that you use to solve the problem. So could you uh, go in details? I mean, the images are already very big and once you make the grid from those, then they, they will get, I mean, bigger, even bigger. So how do you process the image and did you resize them or what was the entire procedure? Also, what other augmentations did you use to use the data set? Cause I mean, if you use nine images from one group, then the number of images that you are fitting to the model will decrease. Or also, I mean, for a given group or a category, how many uh, grids did you make? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you for your questions. And uh, as my limited uh, oral, oral level, so, so Kaiwan, Kaiyo, Shantis is a full for me in Chinese or simple yeah, sure. English so, words. 
呃、uh, ，他问你怎么处理这个呃、uh, grade 的过程的，然后希望你提供一些具体的方法。Yeah, so I think uh the author mentioned his method in detail in the presentation. So basically, they concatenated uh the images belonging to the same same field and uh they concatenated it. By, uh, into a three by three, uh, larger image, and then they uh resize it to a smaller one. It becomes uh ten twenty four by ten twenty four, and feed it into the network. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Uh, any question? Uh, so this result is really impressive. I mean, last year we did uh. So basically, in our 2020 CVPR paper, and we did uh, a lot of testing, I believe our baseline was around uh, 43, right? So the yes, MFU. 43. So this result is more than 10%. It's actually 13% better. And uh, by incorporating this uh, different uh, type of pre-processing, this is very interesting. And uh, it's this is also very different from the other solutions. Where other solutions are still forming this as a semantic semantication problem, so I think overall it's very impressive, and we are very interested in finding more details. And uh, internally, we're actually trying to reproduce the result. So thanks for the the team one, very good presentation. And uh, I know, I mean, it's um, very late in China, and thanks for participating in it as well. Uh, maybe we can move to the next presentation, and if there are more questions, we can direct it to the team one for offline uh, QA as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Kai. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We are ex oh, young yeah. and are experienced machine learning computation players. Challenges. We have won many. This is right. John work with uh, Michael. All right, for, for the second presentation, it's team uh, WRL. Hello, everyone. I'm Fan Yu and from Purdue University. Today, I will rep uh, represent my team WRL to introduce our solution to the second agricultural vision price challenge. This work is mainly done by myself and my friend Yang Liu. The rest three people listed here are our supervisors. We are ex uh, Yang and I are experienced machine learning computation players. We have won many top plays from conference or industry computations, e.g. the NIST, KDD, and EJCA. In total, we have won more than 100,000 US dollars cash price. Those experience help us to reach the top place easily, but might also hinder us create innovation solution in this challenge. In, in summary, we treat this challenge as a multi-label semantic segmentation task. Here, we apply the state-of-the-art encoder decoder, deep lab V3 and FPN with efficient net encoders. Figure two is a main is illustration of our solution. We use both NG, NRGB channels and mask channels as inputs. We use simple 90 degree rotation and flips argumentation during training and testing. We trained four models uh, using the same training recipes. And finally, uh, we ensemble four models by simple weight average. A critical factor that affects the performance is a loss function. We test many different loss functions. Finally, we found out that a hybrid loss uh, works best combining binary cross entropy and jacket loss with equal weights. Figure three, figure three is a sim simplified touch code of the loss function. I want to point out that in line 21 and 22, ignoring the class with all zero labels in one mini batch is critical. Otherwise, the loss is not converged. Here we list the scores for our final, final solution. In general, four single models have similar performance. Our best single model has already reached third place on the leaderboard. Moreover, we just need to ensemble two models and then we can lock down the second place. We also investigate some post-processing methods, e.g. the conditional render, uh, render field and the image dilation. Finally, we choose to apply a simple post-processing method to increase recall of some class that we just double uh, their probability of, of those classes. When this simple post Processing method perform very well in the leaderboard. We realize that it might be better to treat this problem as a multi-class task instead of a multi-label task. However, at that time we had no extra time to run to train any new models. 
Here we provide the importance of each choice in the final solutions. For simplicity, we do not provide straight uh, experiment results. Importance is least in descending order. To choose a suitable encoder is critical for, is, a, is the most critical factor. We start with actual net and only got a score about 40% mean IOU and stuck for one week. Then we switch to efficient net and quickly got a score about 49% well, MIOU, uh, mean intersection over union. To point out, uh, we also test some vision transforming encoders, but none of them yield a significant better result. Given its large parameter numbers, we decide not to include them in the final solution. Other choice list here uh, just for reference purpose. We also attend the semi-supervised learning track during the last week of challenge when the organizer sent emails. At that time, we thought that our solution could still got a second place even not using the extra data. Honestly, we just want to make, make some money from it. So we applied a standard semi-supervised learning method and hope it will work. Unfortunately, maybe our implementation is too rough. Our generated data uh, to fine tune the, using the generated data to fine tune the model will reduce their performance. Beside our rough implementation, I conjecture that the reported method to process the raw images are not correct, or at least not very uh, precise, because we found out some bad samples that using the provide formula and makes that the lower bounds become larger than the upper bound. Uh, those reported processing methods also makes us hard to make the supervised data and raw data set when uh, comparing the pixel difference. So finally, I want to advertise myself a little bit. I will graduate this, uh, in December and receive my PhD degree. Now I'm thinking in engineering or research position in machine learning application. I would appreciate if I could receive some recommendation from you. Here I list my email. Thank you for your watching. That's the end. All right. So do we have any questions from the audience? So is the author here? I have a question though. I think also here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting promotion. First, congratulations on having a really good result. And uh, your result is still much better than our baseline last year, our winning solutions. And um, uh, you do have a very interesting promotion and you're looking for a job, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I think we do have some uh, sponsors here, including, of course, in Tanier, they are actively hiring. And uh, also we have, uh, for example, we have a professor Ed from Purdue. I believe he has a complex hiring as well. So hopefully you will announce a good job. And um, I don't have other questions. Uh, Kai, maybe you can continue. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Najima? I think the method is quite standardized. So it, there's not much uh, things I, I want to. I can introduce, right? And I also already published the code. So if you have any questions, just look at the code that's did come better, yeah. Okay, uh, so if, if there is no questions from the audience, we'll move to the uh, next presentation. So the next presentation is from team uh, SCG Vision. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Qing Hui Liu. Today I'm going to present our models, our networks for the second uh, agriculture vision challenges. This is a joint network with uh, Michael Kampfmeyer, Robert Jensen, and Arm Bruno Thaburg. We are from Norwegian Computer Center and the UIT Machine Learning Group at Norway. Um, yeah. So this picture shows our model's structure. Um, basically, we developed a new uh, pyramid attention and gated fusion framework, namely PAGNet for multi-model segmentation tasks. So basically, the proposed uh, um, framework utilizes a novel fusion uh, method called the gated fusion and the latter refinement mechanism to effectively learn the optimal fused representation 
by uh, pyramid attention modules PIF from multiple modalities. The PIF module actually is designed to uh, obtain a rich uh, context representations by a deeply fused uh, cross view and uh, cross level uh, attention mechanism. And uh, the fused features by the PF module from the primary modalities, such as uh, RGB images, because we consider RGB uh, as the main modalities in this framework, the fused features will be merged into the encoder of the second modality. Here we consider the near infrared, infrared band as the supplementary information of modality. Through a gated fusion unit, this unit is will automatically force the supplementary encoders to learn the valuable information and uh, in the meantime will weaken the influence of its uh, noises. Uh, by this way, the model's performance will be improved. And uh, yeah, best. Uh, so I, I want to go into uh, details today. We are going to publish a paper to introduce our method in the near future. So based on this framework, we uh, build two models. Uh, one small model, we use so-called PIG net mobile. We use uh, mo mobile net v3 as the uh, backbone encoders. Uh, another another model is uh, slightly bigger. We use uh, S uh, we use service net fifty as uh, backbone uh, encoders. So this table shows some uh, quantitative uh, numbers of their related to their parameter size, flows, and inference times. So, yeah. So this slide shows our training details. So basically, we train our models on two GPUs. Uh, one GPU is 28 Ti, is for the small model. Another one, RTX 3090 Ti, is for the big model. And we train our model in three stages. We uh, the first stage we use Adam as optimizer, and uh, uh, with uh, a little bit smaller part size like uh, twelve and sixteen separately for the two models. At the second stage, we switched the optimizer from Adam to SGD and also increased the bar size from the 12 to 18 and from the 16 to 24 separately. And now we train uh, the two models with uh, six cross validated folders. These um, six folders is randomly split. So, and also we use the same loss function as the last year's uh, competition is called adaptive class waiting loss. You can find the code on our GitHub. So here is some uh, validation examples from different stages. Yeah, the, this column, the column C is ground truth. The DEF is um, the validation predictions from the training stage one, stage two, and stage three. So here is our test uh, results. Uh, for the supervised trained models, you can say uh, we first train six models uh, um, for the small uh, model, the PG, PG, PG net mobile. So we then select the top uh, top three best mo best models, and then we uh, we found that the four to two three uh, two four and five uh, can achieve the best uh, performance on the test set. So that when we train the big model, use the these three folders for the RX fifty models. We finally assemble these uh, six models to obtain our best uh, 
uh, test results on the leaderboard. It is uh, 51.5% me you. For the semi-supervised, we just uh, uh, make use of the predictions from the supervised uh, trend uh, models. We put all the predictions as the training ground truth. And then we fine tune to best uh, uh, trend, supervised trend models on the, with the noise labels. And then we obtain uh, two uh, fine tuned semi supervised trend models. We assemble, we assemble them together to, to, to predict the the final um, uh, segmentation maps, so it uh, can obtain fifty one point eight percent mean value on the default. So yeah, this is the overall our results. Uh, in summary, at, uh, our single uh, PIG net mobile can achieve very competitive results with much fewer uh, parameters and uh, uh, more computational efficiencies. And also our simplified self-training based uh, semi-supervised training method can also significantly improve models performance on the test set. We also use multi-stage and overfitting fine tune method to further boost the model's performance together with the uh, test time uh, augmentation and model assemble. And uh, our model's performance can be further improved if we train them with full-size images. In this kind of uh, challenges, we, in order to uh, improve the speed and uh, inference speed and uh, training speed, we just uh, re downsized the input size from uh, 512 to 384. Actually, it slightly uh, decreased our model's performance. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and uh, thanks to the agriculture vision organizers. Thank you. Okay, so do we have questions from the audience? Okay. Brian, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I have yes. a question for you. So you, in your method, you assembled uh, six different models to get the final result. So can you yeah. please uh, tell about the details of how do you ensemble them? I mean, how do you, I mean, you yeah, yeah. the six different models get different results. How do you uh, choose the I final just, one? Uh, actually, assembly is quite uh, quite uh, normal method, just average. Sorry, I, are you lost? Hi, Brian. Hello. Sorry, my I just lost my connection. I don't know why. <laughs> so I just reconnected. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, regarding the assemble, actually, I just use uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very common uh, assemble um, uh, method. Just to average the predictions. Uh, from the TTA, uh, each model will uh, predict, uh, I think, five um, uh, prediction maps. I uh, use a little, uh, use a, something like a temperature sharpening, a little bit of temperature sharpening, uh, uh, to some to average the results together with each uh, models, and then to yeah, then you get the, the uh, get the, the average uh, uh, class predictions. Then you yeah. This is not. Uh, <laughs> it's quite a common method uh, for the for the com uh, competition for the yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Yeah. No, 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 no matter what tricks. <laughs> yeah. All right. 
So uh, yeah, actually, my, my method is quite uh, quite uh, lazy. Actually, I didn't do much pre pre analysis. Just uh, such as like cross validation, just just randomly split split the the uh, validation set. So we didn't uh, we didn't do much uh, pre analysis. The data set like the top the the winners of the challenge. They did a lot of um, you know analysis data set. Actually, we we didn't do so much work on that. That's why if probably we can continue to improve the model's performance if you use some uh, like uh, more, more tricks on pre-processing the data set, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank so you. our evaluation is still open for everyone. So if anyone has an interest in improving the final results, you are welcome to submit your uh, results to our evaluation web. So, uh, any questions for audience? Okay, so next we are move to the posters. This year we have uh, six posters accepted. So first one, uh, this one is from uh, AAU. So is yeah, the author here? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Kim. So could Hello. you please uh, briefly introduce your work in about one minute. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Uh, so our work was in terms of uh, determining dendrometry of, uh, of uh, apple trees in this case, of an orchard. And we want to do that through drone scouting and then using uh, convolutional networks and a pwn climb processing method. So our work was kind of like the entire pipeline of trying to navigate the drone over the orchard, creating a map of the, of the trees to, and from that map, determine the position of the trees. And then uh, afterwards, we wanted to determine some uh, specific waypoints for the drone to fly in between the rows of trees. And the reason why we wanted to have our, those waypoints between the rows of trees was because we wanted to get a better side view from the, of, the, of the trees. So when we had the side view, we could get an RGB and depth, a point cloud of the, of the trees. And from that, we wanted to estimate in this case, we wanted, we wanted to estimate the height of the trees, uh, but it could be expanded to the width or the diameter of the stem or the canopy. Um, yeah, and then we did it both with our uh, convolutional network method where we used the uh, Yolo V3, where we performed transfer learning to uh, use this uh, apple tree class to classify the trees. And then we all also did uh, yeah, the point cloud method where we wanted to uh, yeah, basically just estimate their, their determine if there were trees in the image and then uh, based on some very simple classification. And then uh, we wanted to uh, yeah, determine the height of the trees here also. And we showed it, their paper showed that the point cloud missing point cloud processing method proved to be the most accurate, but it had a much low FPS, which you can see also in the table in the middle of a 2.1 uh, FPS. Whereas the Yolo V3 method proved to be not as accurate, but had much higher FPS. Uh, yeah. Cool, thank you. So do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so I have one question for you. So uh, you used, uh, for the second uh, experiment, you used the real life images, right? So. Uh, is this uh, in the wild uh, environment or it's some data set? This is a wild environment. We went, we went and captured all the images ourselves, both for training and for testing. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's very interesting. So how robust is your method? I mean, from the image, uh, it looks that these trees uh, don't have any leaves. <laughs> so if, uh, how, how is the performance if there, there are some leaves, if there, if it's in different seasons. Yeah, the thing, the thing we experienced was also like when we wanted to train the network, we had images of trees with leaves, but when we went to test it afterwards, all the leaves were falling off. So I had to retrust it. So right now it's only really robust to trees without leaves. So there, the data set will have to be expanded for off apple trees throughout the, all seasons of the year. But that's also it's not really robust at, at this point okay. to seasonal changes. Thank you. 
Uh, any other questions? Okay, let's move to the next poster. So this work is from uh, uh, Milika. Uh, uh, Milika, are you there? Hi. Hi, so Hi. could you please briefly introduce your work? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present our work. And this is a bit different to what's presented in uh, the workshop. So we are focusing on pollinators in this work, which is very important for agriculture. So for example, 87 of food crops with, which human uh, consume depend on pollination for production. And this has shown that if we manage our pollinators better, we can increase our, uh, the crop yield by 25%. But the problem is currently there are no automated methods for pollination monitoring. So we see a, a gap here, like we, are, we can use computer vision. So here what we did was we use computer vision uh, to track and understand pollinator behavior. So in this work, we propose a computer vision-based pollination monitoring pipeline which can be used to collect data, uh, get tracks and analyze the data. And the main contribution of this work is, uh, we have proposed a new algorithm called PolyTrack, which uses foreground background segmentation and deep learning simultaneously to uh, identify pollinators and track them. So this algorithm consists of like three main components. Uh, what is, one is flower identification component, uh, so the identifying flower is very important as uh, the pollination depends on it. And there's a high resolution mode and low resolution, resolution mode for effective process uh, and efficient processing. And here we have presented our results. It's pretty uh, like compared to YOLO V4 and uh, uh, HIDAT, which was a previous algorithm of us, uh, it performs better. and. Finally, in uh, box seven, we present an example data analysis in uh, analyzing the uh, honeybee behavior in strawberry. So we here we can actually see where the uh, pollinators headed, and based on that, we can predict how much is the pollination, how much, how well is it is pollinated, and what should be improved on to better pollinate. Cool. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience? Can you provide a little more info on the Hungarian algorithm, like what you're doing for the actual matching? So Hungarian algorithm, we basically use to, we use a predict and detect approach to associate predictions with detections when you're tracking from frame to frame, we use the Hungarian algorithm. I think okay, that's thank answered. You. Sure. Yeah, I have a question. So in your work, you track the uh, pollinators, right? Yeah. So have you encountered any occlusion problem? For example, if the bee is covered by the leaf uh, during the flying? Yes, so, uh, actually for like previous research, uh, which is the high data algorithm, we proposed a method to uh, identify occlusions and uh, how to overcome them. But here, there were a few applications, but in this use case, we mainly focused on uh, tracking them, uh, like ignoring occlusions because uh, when pollination monitoring uh, occlusions, it doesn't really matter much in our use context, but uh, we came across occlusions and we used, uh, basically used their covering area, the pixels is covered and we analyze the change to identify occlusions and solve them. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move to the next poster. So this work is from Chao Ren. Hi Chao Ren, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Hi, could you please uh, briefly introduce your work? Uh, yeah, so about uh, work of our group, uh, there are majorly two things. The first thing is the uh, so-called 100 data sets. 
uh, which uh, consists of uh, which consists of about uh, forty eight thousand RGB images from one different cultivars of sorghum uh, from our terrorist project. The next thing is about the the classic uh, about so doing the classification test about the sorghum hundred percent. So we are using the multi-resolution dynamic outlier pooling method. In this method, there are two parts. One part is the multi-resolution. So we have two two different uh, crops of the re uh, resolution, two different resolutions of the crop from the image and uh, classify them side by side and uh, concatenate the feature better together. And uh, the another thing is the uh, dynamic outlier pooling, uh, which like uh, we choose the to some parts, but uh, which is uh, different from the average uh, average outer, average pooling and the max pooling. We choose uh, some amongst activated parts of the images. Uh, uh, not like a max pooling, which is only use one, and not like the average pooling, which is all the activity values. We just use the values that above a specific uh, threshold. So this uh, this is more from EQ to the we think this is more like uh, suitable to the cultural classification data because this is. Uh, because uh, because in in the uh, cultural images, we think maybe there are in the images there may be a few points of interest. In. So this is more suitable to the cultural data set. So as a result, uh, we found that the multi-resolution and the dynamic outer pooling, when we use them together, they we will get a faster result compared with the uh, average pony or max pony or the just high resolution or just low resolution crops. So that's all. Okay, interesting. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, so let's move on. So the next work is from Ziqiao Wang. Ziqiao, are you there? Uh, any author for this work? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, it looks that we don't we don't have author here. So let's move on. So the next one is uh, from Shubham. Shubham, are you there? Okay, let's keep moving. <laughs> so Hello. the la In this video, I'm going to talk about our work. Super so the last work is from uh, Saba. So Saba, are you there? I don't think Zab is on, but I can talk a little bit about it. Sure, please go ahead. Hello. So, so the, the goal of this work was in the past, we've done some work to detect uh, nutrient deficiency stress, similar to the, the pattern that's in the agriculture vision data set. Uh, in, in some past work, our, our emphasis was on trying to get as, as high a prediction uh, performance as possible, you know, using, you know, as much of the, much of the data as well as like the, the temporal component of the data. Um, you know, combining multiple flights to do a better prediction. But here the focus was on trying to uh, make something that was lightweight um, and, and efficient, where if we don't necessarily care about pixel level accuracy, if we just want to find areas of the field that have this um, stress indicator that we can do that in an in a efficient way. So um, the main approach was to break up the field into super pixels uh, using slick. And then from those super pixels, um, we created uh, 
the set of features for the the nodes based on basically the the histogram of um, uh, the 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 NDVI and color histograms, and then um, for our edges using um, similarity between the um, between the nodes and the distance to to initially start with a fully connected graph and then um, adjust the weights as the the model trains. Uh, we tried two different approaches. One, which is that um, given that we had pixel level uh, labels when we created the super pixels, um, the classification task we either called that node positive. Um, in this case, if any any pixel in that node contained uh, the positive class, then we also tried a regression task where we would actually predict the fraction of um, of, of pixels that had had a, a positive label. Um, given the way we formulated it, we actually saw the, the classification task performed um, perform better than the regression task, but I think there's some other things that we can do in kind of future work to um, boost the, the, re the regression task as well. Um, and so, um, yeah, would, you know, this, uh, this model had, I think it's something, if I remember correctly, like 4,800 parameters co compared to I the don't millions see the satellite. slides changing. I don't know, do others see the slides changing? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, uh, it's just the just the video. Changing. I don't. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, but the uh, yeah, you can see the you can see the video with the different the different paper results are on the um, on the website. So um, yeah, so the the main idea is that right this this model has you know five thousand parameters compared to a couple of million, so it's much lighter weight, uh, much you know trains in a matter of minutes, um, and uh, you know and if 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 we're you know if you're the application is looking to you know, get these kind of key areas as opposed to trying to drill down to the, um, you know, pixel level accuracy um, provides a, a nice alternative. And I think also kind of for future work sets up the ability to use this graph based approach um, in the temporal regime where um, it'll have some more stability to say image reg registration shifts. So. Okay, cool. Thank you. So uh, that's all for the challenge presentation and the posters. So thank every participant for the challenge and the uh, poster authors. So next we'll go for the uh, invited talk question and answer. So, so uh, Kai, I think we still have some questions collected online. Maybe you can send to the authors offline and uh, we can post it somewhere. I think for the poster, including the two didn't show up because of the time zone issues. Yeah, sure, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, all your participation. So uh, we probably will take just a, a couple of minutes break. Uh, we are waiting for a few guests to join, a few invited speakers, and uh, we will start uh, probably in about three minutes. So please stay uh, on the line, thanks.
So hi everyone. Thanks uh, again for uh, joining the workshop. So we we now we are moving to the second session of our workshop, and uh, we will have uh, our thirty minutes. Uh, actually, let me go back. So our overall schedule now is we will have about thirty minutes for the Q and A sessions for the invited talks, uh, which are already posted on the our YouTube channel about two days ago. And uh, then we will have a panel discussion will be hosted by Professor Nara. And um, we're talking about challenge and opportunity for computer vision it will last about one hour. So uh, let's move to the QA session for the invited talks. I hope that uh, uh, many of you have watched these videos already. And before that, we want to again thank the sponsors uh, from Intenior, Indiego Ag, and um, Microsoft from the industry who provided a, a generous gift to our price challenge. And uh, for this uh, invited speaker sessions, we have uh, our alliance of a speaker from both academia and the industry. And uh, we have uh, le uh, leaders in uh, like large companies like Microsoft and Google who are leading their agricultural efforts also from the uh, like academia. In particular this year, different from our first uh, session is that uh, we have um, two of the NSF AI Institute for agriculture, one is the uh, next generation food assistance from UC Davis. We have a uh, uh, Brian and uh, Mason here to uh, answer the questions related to that. And also, uh, we have uh, another center uh, at the UIUC, the USDA uh, NIFA Institute for uh, the AI Farms. And uh, Professor Alex Schwein is here and will be able to answer questions related to that. This is a very exciting development because uh, previously in our last session, most of the effort were driven by independent academic research or by uh, industry. And uh, now we have a, a, like a national level support from the large funders like USDA and uh, uh, NSF, et cetera. So this is very exciting uh, new things this year. And our invited talks, all of them are on the YouTube and we are listing some of the title here. And we have collected some questions online. We will be asking those, but uh, uh, we'll be going through this uh, probably one by one because we only have uh, 30 minutes and we're not able to uh, show the content of this. So hopefully you have watched this before joining this session. So we will first be taking some uh, questions from the audience if you have uh, regarding this question, uh, regarding these talks. And uh, then we will uh, read some of the questions where we collected online. So uh, let us first start with our keynote speak from uh, Ranveer uh, Chandra, who is currently the CTO for the agriculture and the food efforts at Microsoft. And uh, his talk is about data-driven agriculture. So any questions from the audience? And uh, if not, I think we collected several questions. Um, our first question is from Saidia. Uh, so Saida, you are here, right? Uh, why don't you read your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, actually I had a question about the farm beats. Uh, of course, first of all, it's very exciting that Microsoft is doing such a great work um, with agriculture and AI. But I was wondering, especially in developing countries, Farmers and breeders, they're not, um, they don't have enough education to know how to manage those like high tech devices and do stuff like that. I was wondering, is there a way that, like um, you could create a product similar to Farm Beats for students, but for farmers and breeders, for them to learn how to use those high tech devices, like, um, and you know, learn that like machine learning a little bit and AI, because I feel like every, everybody needs to know that. And, yeah, so. Yeah, no, that's a great point, uh, Saida. Yeah, you know, to take some of the, so for others who might not have heard the talk, so Farm Beats uh, for students, this is a student kit that we developed for, uh, this is for high schools, that is uh, in the US. We partnered with FFA, the Future Farmers of America, where we created a kit and the curriculum along with it to get the students to get familiar with data-driven agriculture, how data can be used for agriculture techniques. The reason we were doing that is one, to bridge the skill gap, that is help the rural communities uh, be more skilled for all the technical jobs that are coming up. And it's also for these students while they are in high school to think about how can they apply data and AI techniques 
for agriculture. So we created this where uh, we've, uh, we've been doing this uh, for a couple of years now and are expanding the program. So that's a great point, Saida, that you'd mentioned that, well, why don't you take it to emerging markets? And we are thinking about it, the challenge would be, one would be the language, that is, how do you adapt it to different languages, to different, because here in high schools, there is, uh, the, the skilling is, uh, they're more skilled, but maybe it is, for, it could be for breeders, that could be another interesting uh, idea, because even over here, when we were building this kit, we got requests from other agricultural companies for hackathons, we used it at the Cornell uh, digital agriculture hackathon as well. So there are opportunities, we'd love to explore, we'd love to chat what we can do there. Uh, right now our focus with the kit is here. Although for the emerging markets, there are a lot of open problems that need to be addressed. In fact, there is a paper that I've written with uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, Stuart Collis, who's the digital ag lead, which will be uh, published in CACM, Communications of the ACM uh, over the summer. So there we talk about some of these challenges. We don't talk about the kit, but I think uh, that's a great idea. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that um, actually Microsoft already have something there in place and uh, it has been effort there. It's a great uh, direction there. And uh, we were selecting another uh, question from the, uh, so Najamal is a student from um, Bangladesh. And why don't you ask your question here? Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. And it's really exciting to know that Microsoft is doing all of these works to make agriculture available uh, to all of them and in a better way using AI. So my uh, question is one thing that I wanted to mention, mention. What happens in Bangladesh is that actually natural calamities uh, take all of the grains and crops that are grown after us. For example, uh, in every three or four years, we have this flood and but the people, the farmers, they cannot uh, take their food or crops in, in their home because, I mean, uh, the flood takes it away just for like, like seven days or maybe sometimes 10 days ago. So if we could just somehow like grow the crops like seven days or 10 days earlier somehow using uh, technology or maybe using uh, genetic bioengineering technologies. Or also sometimes they are also, I mean, drought also affects for i think last year what happened was there was some warm wind hot wind that actually reduced the yield by a large scale so i was wondering um, is there any initiative going on uh, based on the natural calamities and how can we um, handle them more efficiently thank you yeah no that is a great question uh well this is uh uh, you know, because one of the bigger problems happens in uh, with the kind of thing that you mentioned is how do you do uh, climate forecasting over longer periods of time that is beyond just a week. So there is some work happening in this space. Uh, there was some work published from Microsoft on sub seasonal climate forecasting that is between two to six weeks. How do you uh, how do you make those further ahead prediction predictions. In fact, if people can predict over the entire season what the weather is going to be, you can then start doing even better. And there's some very cool work happening in academia as well. Um, I know of work happening at uh, Purdue, at Cornell, as well as Illinois, where I've been, I've been talking to experts in that space. And there is that I think if someone could do, then you could be better prepared for, for some of these calamities. So that's one. The second problem is about adding visibility into the entire supply chain. You know, when these kind of calamities happen, if you can, like the locust problem that happened last year, it was mostly started in Sub-Saharan Africa, but then went all over uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and other places, where with those kind of problems, if you could immediately respond to things as they are happening, where a lot of the computer vision techniques could be very interesting, where you could immediately flag what's going on, detect what's going on, and send notifications to the right people. So that's again, another hard problem. There's some work happening there. We did some work with uh, Purdue University, Professor Jason Lusk, who's the head of Ag Econ at Purdue. We created this dashboard for uh, food and ag visibility in the supply chain, where in this dashboard, you could click on a commodity, you could click on a county, and then we would tell you uh, what is the risk of, uh, of say, that, that, that commodity in that particular county. So, but that's again, just the initial stages of what we've done. But I think one part of it is on prediction, being able to predict what might be happening, drought, flood, uh, insects, diseases, any of those calamities, or 
uh, and in addition to that, creating some sort of visibility so that you're able to respond faster, both with respect to uh, genetic improvements or with respect to getting the right, right chemicals at the right, right place at the right time, to even getting the entire supply chain prepared for such a calamity that might be happening. So uh, I know what I mentioned was, so you know, these are hard problems. There are some startups, some academics, some bigger companies working in this space, but uh, overall, I would say, um, I'm assuming most of you here are researchers. So this is, this is a place that needs uh, very active research, especially when you think of the emerging markets. Because you know, one of the underlying things of climate change is that a lot of these problems are also happening because of climate change. And the interesting thing about that is the people who will be impacted most because of any of the climate variations are the smallholder farmers. There are more than 500 million of these smallholder farmers and they are going to be impacted the most. And it's upon all of us to develop techniques to help them go through the situation better. But overall, I think this is an open problem. There are some initial things which are promising and I would be open to connecting with you and uh, chatting more if, you're, if anyone is working in this space. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hopefully someday we can actually address this natural disaster uh, scenarios. And due to time uh, concern, so we are only able to uh, take two questions per speaker. So now we need to move to the second speaker. Thank you, Ranveer, and uh, hope to see you soon in the panel session. Thank you. Yeah. So our second question, uh, invited to talk is the uh, data-driven decisions in agriculture by Professor Munther. Uh, but he is not able to make it to our workshop today due to other conflicts. Uh, I believe one of the uh, member on the team is here. And um, please confirm if you are here, then we yes. were. Yeah, That's thank me. you. I am Bernardo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Bernardo. And uh, so um, first uh, we'll give the chance to the audience if uh, anyone has a question, otherwise we will take uh, questions from the, our online forums. I've got a question. Uh, I did submit it online as well. Um, so I, I looked through, I, I saw your talk and I, I know one of the key parts is this idea that you've got this matrix of combinations, you have some sparse entries and you're trying to fill it out. Um, and you mentioned that one of the inputs for these sparse entries is, you know, these, these simulation models like, like WOFOST. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not familiar with them. So is there, is there a reason why you can't use WOFOST to generate every entry in the matrix? Is it? Um, so we we work with um, with the people who were in charge of Wofast, and as we understood it, um, Wofast Wofast was not tested across the whole globe, of course, but it was tested uh, within the Netherlands, which is where where the creators uh, where the creators live, and we um, we decided that. Uh, and Wofast takes as input, for example, the soil profile and profiles of the crop. Uh, for each of uh, to make the simulation, and the um, the the information for the soil profiles across the globe um, it is it, it is available, but up to a certain degree. So, for example, there is this uh, that I said called the Wise, which has uh, which divided the the Earth in in different soil profiles. I think North America had around uh, six hundred. Um, but e e even in those very high precision uh, data sets, the, um, the variables available for each soil type are not enough uh, to run the model. So we have to estimate those given the variables that are available. So then it becomes estimation over estimation uh, because you have to estimate the variables that you do not have available for each soil profile. Uh, and then you will estimate the, the crop, but then your error will be larger than what, what you think is. So that's why we we think it is better to to try to also complement the simulations with real data. So so do you just not use the simulation at all, or are there some cases where you can you have some idea of confidence? We do, we do. So all of our early work is just with simulations because that is what's most readily available. And when we can, we use uh, we use both the simulations and the real data. Uh, and that also allows us to see how close the simulations are to, real, to the real data and whether we should try to dig in more for more real data or we can just uh, continue with this hybrid approach. Got it. Thank you. No, thank you for your question. Yeah, thanks. Do we have other questions? 
Yeah, then I'll take uh, one question from the online forum. Actually, there are several questions about the well-fast method. Uh, so there's a quick question here is, uh, while validating the simulations, how did the farmers maintain the certain amount of uh, uh, irrigation fertilizers so that you can make a fair comparison? That is, that is also a, a very good question. And that is also a big challenge. Um, the, the USDA has, this, has a database in the US for the yield in agriculture in different, uh, at the county level, the average yield at the county level. And for some crops, it does separate between irrigated uh, farms and non-irrigated uh, irrigated crops and non-irrigated uh, crops. So for example, for each county in Missouri, we have a measure of how, how, what was the yield of bushels per acre with irrigated corn and with non-irrigated corn. In case, of course, there, there, there were some farms doing irrigated and some farms doing non-irrigated. Uh, and in Wofast, you can modulate um, when you do the simulation, you can modulate how much irrigation you will do um, along with whatever weather uh, and rainwater was available on the, on, on the year you are simulating. Um, now, Wofast allows for much more precision because e even with that data, data, we do not know how much irrigation uh, exactly there was in, in these irrigated crops and, um, and in Wofast. We can tune every day how much irrigation we want to simulate uh, for the crop. So, so we have this course separation where we can uh, where we can confirm. But uh, as they point out, we cannot know, for example, if some farms were doing irrigation but very constrained irrigations, and some farms were doing very loose irrigation. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bernardo. Yeah. Um, so we'll move to the next talk, and uh, thanks again. Uh, so next is about the mineral project. So this project was uh, still uh, actually brewing last year when we had the first workshop. And uh, this year, finally, uh, it is uh, released from the Google X, the Moonshot Factory. And we thank Jim to sharing uh, the details about the mineral with us uh, in the talk. And uh, Jim is uh, also here who is uh, leading this project at the Google. And so uh, first we will take some questions from the audience if we have. Um, hi, I, I just submitted the question um, around an hour ago, so I, I'm not sure whether it's already collected in, in your form. Can I just ask it now? Sure, sure, please. Um, so um, um, I'm very, very interested in this project because I'm also working on kinds of yield estimation. And my question is like, I, I found in your video that you have some car-like things that you um, go all the way across the field to take photo of the weeds and so on. And then you, you, you mentioned that you use the photos on the virus lighting conditions, shininess and so on um, to make this yield estimation. So um, could you please share a bit, bit, bit more in detail? Um, what is the information that you use to estimate the productions? Sure. So actually, we uh, we are working on uh, dozens of different crops. So so for different crops, there's different inputs. So uh, I don't think there's one recipe for all solution uh, first. And every single different crop we worked on actually have a different solution. Let's take this way, right? So on the other hand, we are working with domain expert uh, who actually understand what what traits actually has a good impact on the yield. Our work is really help those experts to get all these traits very, very easily and at a scale. So in the end, we can use all those traits. Some, some crop has about five traits, some crop we carry about more than 10 traits or even 20 traits. So for the crops we work, the, probably more than 20 or 30 of those crops, uh, every single crop is different. So it's, and, and I, I don't think there is a universal answer to any of this. But in the end, those trees are actually getting together into modeling phase, and we can produce a yield. So I hope that's a little bit, I know it's a vague, but uh, in the end, every single tree, uh, every single crop is just so different. Yeah, so there's no one sure for fit all fit uh, answer. So uh, Jim, uh, may I ask actually a follow-up question here is, uh, you know that um, we all know that uh, the two biggest uh, crops in the United States are uh, basically corns and uh, 
uh, and uh, the other one is uh, beams, soybeans, right? So, um, how do you address? I mean, what kind of information are you using to estimate the yield for these two different crops? Can you share, or is a complete secret? I don't think it's a complete secret. So, so, so uh, some part is actually already. Uh, uh, we find pattern for sure, but but I, I don't think that's too too secret. Yeah, because every soy soybean breeder will tell you, you know the the leaf index, uh, the bean number of beans, uh, pods, and uh, you know, and uh, probably a number of seeds as well. The and, and the the height of pod, uh, height of the soybean is super 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 important. I think uh, those are the kind of things that we, we definitely consider for soybean. We care about probably more than ten traits. And all, all dealing with through the computer vision process, and for so most soybean, of these are computer vision based measurement. Yeah, these are all computer vision based measurement. Some something we haven't really published yet, but but I think since we're getting more and more clear, as we are stepping into more, I think commercial steps. I think so. Uh, but but I can guarantee really, every single thing is covered by computer vision. Yes, so so we do all everything by computer vision. That's great. Thank you. I'm very, very happy to know because we are in the computer vision community. And um, uh, we have also seen some other, other similar effort to some extent. For example, we do know that at UIUC, they have some other robots who are uh, running in the field to estimate the heights and other traits. And um, so do we have more questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'll take one from the online pool. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Go ahead, please. Um, um, actually, my major question is because you also mentioned about lighting conditions and shininess. So, uh, do you use color as as um, also one of your features of, of your model? Yes, for certain crops, yes. Uh, it's not universal. Some crops are uh, more sensitive to color, and, and others don't. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Jim. And uh, uh, a quick question before you go is that. Um, uh, there is a question from the audience ask, uh, from the online who are asking that um, uh, how do you address the, uh, the, the robotics issue where like you have a, a very muddy field and or because of weather or other issues and uh, uh, how do you tackle this with your technology? And uh, do you plan to do this by drones or mainly by moving robots on the ground? So, uh... Ooh, our truck is definitely has a limitation, as you can probably um, imagine that very, very, I mean, muddy places, there's, there's limitation of how we can reach it. But the technology, I think, is still the same. And what kind of form factor is the end actually doesn't matter too much, right? So uh, as long as uh, the fundamental methodology actually works well, I, I think it can be extended to actually a lot of different surfaces. I, I think that's our assumption as well. OK, thank you. And uh, before you go, just uh, one message is that uh, one uh, participant requests that um, Google to have more effort in this AI plus ag uh, movement to make it reachable to more people in the developing countries, etc. Thanks. Yeah, so let's move to the next talk. And our next talk is uh, the NSF AI Institute at the uh, UIUC, the AI Farms Institute, and the Professor Alex Schoen is here. So any questions from everyone? Hi, Alex. So uh, there is a one question is about actually the technical details for the panoptic segmentation forecasting models. Have you explored the attention based or even transformers based backbones instead of RNN based approaches for the things forecasting? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, that is one of the directions that we're currently looking into um, and, and something that we're currently considering. Um, we, um, the one concern here is that the, the data isn't as vast as we typically have it in, in like an NLP community where transformers have been very successful. So one of the points to always consider is um, how to, I guess, make transformers work in uh, domains where there isn't as much data. So excellent question. Uh, we're looking into that. Um, we don't have, I guess, results 
positive results that I could share at this point. Yeah, uh, so hopefully we can improve the transformers, make it adaptive for smaller data sets. And the second question is also a little bit technical, probably. It's about uh, this uh, novel uh, panoptic segmentation forecasting. So how does the model reproduce the background, the stuff, which was previously occluded by the objects and things? For consecutive frames, when things are occluding each other, how is the object accurately reconstructed in the anticipated frame? Right, yeah, great question. So I guess maybe I, I describe a little bit of what is happening. So we have three input frames um, that cover what that scene looked like in the past. And we first divide that three input frames into what is visible in the, I guess, what is background and what is foreground. And then the foreground objects are the ones that we assume move because of object motion and because of camera motion. And the background we assume moves only because of um, camera motion. Now, um, to forecast the, the background, we then project the information into 3D, apply the camera motion of the observer, and then project it back in, into 2D. And I guess as the question alluded to, uh, by doing that, there's obviously missing pieces um, for which we don't have information because that, that those parts were occluded in the first place. Um, we now have a refinement module on top, which is essentially used to kind of in paint or, or guess uh, what are the, those missing pieces? And that refinement module is crucial um, to exactly address that issue that, that this question pointed out. How do, how do we uh, kind of infer the information that is missing? And, and that refinement module takes care of that. And it is learned uh, end to end to, uh, to actually deal with that. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the answer. And sure. uh, yeah, we can probably talk more about the AI farms itself in the panel session. Uh, but thanks for the, yeah. And next, uh, let's move to the uh, the next talk from John Deere and the Blue River. And uh, Chris, are you here? Yeah, thank good, you. Good morning. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for joining. So uh, still, uh, we will leave a, a question to the audience if there is anyone who wanna ask uh, live. Or we will just uh, uh, read one of the questions we collected. So um, there is a question about how does the weed properties vary for different crops? And uh, is it possible to find a suitable time to use the weeding machine in a specific time for a specific, specific crop to maximize weed separation and segmentation quality? And uh, the cost uh, growth rate patterns of the weeds and the uh, crops should vary from each other. Yeah, thanks. Oh yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thanks so much for, for asking it. The, uh, yeah, definitely modeling that or trying to segment uh, weeds with our system, that is definitely the challenge. Uh, we have, uh, our system is, is capable of crop and weed segmentation. And it just in kind of a, a pixel, pixel wise based uh, approach here, um, we've got a lot more examples of crop than we do of weeds. And also the because the crops that we work in are all uh, of the same genetic variety. So you actually don't see a lot of variation uh, in, in the soybeans, for example, unless they have uh, some kind of uh, damage to them, you know, either herbicide damage or uh, drought damage or, or something like that, insect damage, that can that could cause a bit of variation. But on the weeding side specifically, uh, the, there's really almost an unlimited variation that you can experience. Uh, you know, there's there's thousands of different types of weeds, and uh, even within one species, there's a lot of variation. So, like Palmer amaranth or pigweed, for example, there's a number of different types of of species uh, uh, underneath that that actually have a lot different look. And if you think about, you know, what what happens to a small weed? Well, it gets bigger and becomes a problem. So we have to model weeds at each stage of their growth height, and we need a lot of data to train our models at, at each of these growth stages. Uh, the question about like when to enter the field is is really a great one. Um, what you what you're seeing with uh, a lot of Midwest farmers, a lot of farmers in the U.S. specifically, is that they have a herbicide program that. Uh, 
is actually pretty good at uh, at um, at controlling weeds. And with with the kind of seed spray machine, what they can do is is actually enter the field uh, more times than they normally would. So generally speaking, they uh, and, it, and it really depends on the region here. You know, if you're a soybean farmer in kind of Illinois, uh, you would probably enter the field two or three times. But if you're a cotton farmer in the, in the Delta or South Texas, you might actually go up to 10 times. And that's a kind of a big advantage for our, our machine because we can, if you have a kind of a, you know, a precision delivery device, then you can just go in and only hit the weeds that, that you care about and save a lot of material that way. So it really kind of depends on the farming practice, what the farmer's herbicide program is, where they're operating, and also, importantly, it, it really depends on, uh, on, on really kind of the, the goal that they're trying to accomplish and, and the weather. The weather is a big thing too. So a lot of times farmers are racing against the weather. So they have a plan of what they'd like to do. And then the weather comes in and now they have to adapt and change that plan. So that's actually kind of the biggest variable um, that farmers have to deal with. Sure, thank you. Yeah, that was actually two questions. So probably we can move to the next one. Thanks, Chris. Sure. And uh, yeah, uh, if there are more questions, we'll pass, uh, pass along to you offline. And uh, we are a little bit, uh, uh, actually we are out of our time for the QA session, but we will probably spend a little bit time for the panel to discuss this. And uh, so we might extend our panel a little bit. Hope everyone can uh, still stay here after the one and a half hour urgent plan the time. So we're going to quickly move to the next few talks we have for the QA. Uh, our next talk is uh, from UC Davis, from uh, Brian and uh, Mason. So this is, uh, uh, there is a question from the audience about the uh, Helios generalization system. So uh, the question is, uh, is a Helios generalizable to all types of plants, like uh, crops and fruits? Sure, and I'm going to represent Brian today because he couldn't make it. I'll do my best to answer some of the questions about, about that. So um, as far as the generalizability of Helios goes, it's, it's really a, I guess there are a few parts to it. Um, one, there's a geometry generation part, right? So that, that piece is, it's a parametric uh, framework for generating plant geometries. So in that sense, that is as generalizable as, as you can make it. Uh, there's, there's certainly some, um, human involvement in terms of the initial parameterization and development of any given crop or plant type that you would make uh, within Helios. And then the second part is the biophysics uh, engine that drives anything from water use through photosynthesis, through kind of light propagation, heat transfer, and also just the biochemistry, the biochemical reactions that occur within the plants. So uh, that piece again is parameterizable, um, but you know, we, it's built based on measurements. So I would say yes, but it, any new crop does require um, some initial input to get going. Sure, thank you. And uh, a quick question following this is, uh, while creating a synthetic data set using this uh, Helios, is it possible to include uh, other properties like the impact of soil properties, irrigation and the fertilization on the generated uh, plant, et cetera? Um, it, it's certainly possible. Right now, I don't think that's being uh, done endogenously within the model. So you would you would need to understand what the effect is or what that relationship is between uh, soil properties, for example, and the plant itself and, and kind of make that link. Um, right now, the environmental piece that's most strongly connected is both the temperature, water availability. So that's maybe a place where the soil properties could be linked uh, and also light uh, propagation and kind of absorption. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Sure. This is a giant effort, thanks. Uh, we'll see you again in the, in the other talk. And uh, uh, for the next talk here, we have uh, 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 India, uh, Indigo Apps and uh, for, talk about the digital gap in agriculture. And uh, do we have a question from the audience? Well, I'll take one from online. Uh, okay, I'll take one from online then. So uh, there is a comment. Thanks for the exciting demo. And uh, 
uh, the satellite satellite images are covering a huge range of data. How were the grain beans detected? Was it by just cropping the image and then detecting the circular regions? Also, another question is how were the swimming pools separated from the beams? Hello, can you guys hear me? Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, it was basic, yeah, computer vision in detection using the shape, the circular shapes, and essentially using the reflecting the colors. That was the main, the main way to differentiate folds from, from grain beans. That's more or less what I know. This is not a project I, I did myself. I recently joined the team about a month and a half ago, but it was just a computer vision workflow. Okay, great. Thank you. And do you have other question from the audience? If not, Pablo, we can leave some of the discussion about the digital gap in the panel. And uh, thanks, uh, Exno. See you soon. And um, we have a two more talks. We'll quickly go over. One is the uh, from Italian from Jennifer about the smart farming together. Do we have a question here? And uh, there is one question from online. Is about the. Uh, so thank you for the talk. The soil quality is an important factor for increasing yields. Is it possible to detect the soil quality and suggest the suitable crops based on the soil quality using aerial images? Um, I'm not sure uh, what you're referring to here in terms of soil quality. I mean, certainly um, we have information about uh, soil type, um, which will have certain properties, you know, in terms of how well they um, hold on to water and things like that. Um, you know, I think, you know, depending on the type of sensors you use, you know, you might be able to, you know, differentiate, you know, based on, you know, uh, weather plus different sensor indicators, you know, being able to differentiate um, little broader types of soil across the, uh, across the field. But I think if you're going to get into like highly specific, you know, one of, you know, 600 types, um, that is probably not likely, you know, going to be be achievable from from imagery without, you know, a very, you know, um, you know, high hyperspectral, you know, other other signals, um, but you know, not probably not from from RGB. But you can still, um, there are other ways of, again, soil quality. Um, you can detect things like erosion uh, more on the the topo scale that you know how the the soil is set up that could um, that could impact could impact yield. Sure, thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting that you're moving from collecting, organizing the crop information to understanding actually the ground, the soil, etc. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, we will move to the, uh, the final invited talk so that we can start our panel right away. And uh, we have a one uh, invited talk from uh, Mason about AI enabled ag for the crops we eat. This is a very interesting talk. I like it a lot myself. And uh, do we have a question here from the audience? So I'll read one of the questions we collected. So uh, thanks for the talk. My question is on the yield uh, mo monitor versus the image-based predator graph. What does a po uh, position in the vineyard grow, uh, row mean? And how yield the monitor calculate the yield? Sure. Um, so this is for those who haven't seen the talk, this is a point we're trying to often make, which is when we have a lot of occlusion, and we're using image-based techniques for fruit counting and detection. Um, we, we often don't have a strong correlation between on the ground measured yield and what we're predicting from images, right? And this is a common phenomena. Uh, oftentimes, for better or worse, we don't have a lot of ground truth yield data. So the validation and, and real, real ground truth data is not available. So we many papers and, and efforts will just stop at uh, making a prediction about um, making just a prediction of what they see in the image, counting what's visible. So uh, along, so the question specifically was about the graph. The graph position along vineyard is just sequentially just the, the yield as you move along a row. So in a vineyard, you have rows. This is just, each of those are three different rows. Uh, I kind of left it stylized just to make the point uh, that, that the relationship was pretty poor and we see that over and over again. Sure, thank you. Uh, next, we will move to the, uh, the panel session uh, discussion. And uh, also, uh, not everyone's list here. So Jennifer, 
uh, Nara and uh, also Bernardo, please feel free to stay if you have time. And um, uh, Nara, are you ready? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank everyone for their um, participation, contribution, all the ideas we had, uh, all the interesting talks we listened to. I want to welcome our new members. For the, uh, this year we have a new member joining this panel from uh, Blue River Technology from Indigo Ag, UC Davis, and Swarm Engineering. Uh, I look forward to your contributions today to this panel. Uh, we have also new sponsors, Microsoft and Indigo Ag also co-sponsored the prize channel, uh, the prize uh, challenge together with Intellinaire. So it's very encouraging to see that we are able to grow the sponsorship so we can sponsor more younger people uh, to join these incredible uh, challenges in digital agriculture and have more people uh, joining this uh, industry, this junior industry and grow the interest and participation, inspire more people to join this journey with us. And uh, thank you Ranbir for doing this very interesting keynote. I appreciate your leadership uh, with this regard, so you are kind of giving lots of visibility to the workshop by doing a keynote. Uh, thank you all for being here. So let's move forward with the panel. And Hongkui, thank you for leading this very interesting question and answer discussion today. Sure, I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh... yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> nice meeting all of you again. So now we have everybody's screen uh, on a bigger shape. Uh, uh, so let's start. So I forwarded, I think, the panel questions to everyone who got the email for the invitation for the panel. Uh, so let's go around the screen and maybe do a quick introduction of everyone who is on the panel. Uh, so I'm Nairo Hovakimian, professor of University of Illinois, and I'm chief scientist and co-founder of Intel in Air, one of the sponsors of this workshop. And uh, if I go around the screen, so first one I see is Hong Kui. Hong Kui, just go ahead and introduce yourself. And I'll just, because the Zoom screen, I think is arranged differently sure, on sure. everyone's screen. I'll yeah, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Nara. And uh, so first, uh, please, all the panelists, uh, please turn on the video camera so that you probably you will show on the first screen of the, in the gallery view. And if you haven't changed your view to gallery view, probably can change that. So you can see all the faces. We're, we're doing this remotely. Again, last year we did it remotely, and uh, this time again, hopefully next year, we're going to do in person, which is and very- May common. I request that you all share this, um, maybe post on LinkedIn, so for maximum exposure, because one of the objectives of hosting these workshops within CBPR is to get maximum outreach worldwide, so that to engage junior people to work on these challenging problems, that's why, I created a post on LinkedIn, I shared. You can create your own post or just share mine because it's ready. So we maximize uh, our recruitment opportunities um, as we go forward, right? So won't we move forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, so a very brief introduction. I'm currently a professor at the University of Oregon and I'm working on computer vision. And uh, I've been fortunate to be uh, working on this very fascinating topic of agriculture plus AI for uh, several years. And I've been collaborating with the NARA on this topic uh, with uh, several efforts. And uh, thanks again for everyone coming. And uh, let's move to the next speaker who is on the screen. Yeah, NARA, your call, you're the host. So I see Mason. Mason, you are the next on my screen. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Mason Earls, uh, assistant professor at UC Davis in bio and ag engineering and viticulture and oenology. And I'm also working a lot on different problems related to AI and agriculture and sensing. So, Chris, you are the next on my screen. Yep. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Chris Padwick, uh, the director of computer vision and machine learning at Blue River Technology, uh, wholly owned a subsidiary of John Deere. Uh, we work on a uh, product we call Sea and Spray. And uh, yeah, happy to be part of this panel today. Really excited to be part of the, part of the discussion. Thank you so much. Jennifer, you are the next on my screen. Jennifer. Okay. Sure. Yep. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hobbs. I'm the director of machine learning at Intel and Air. So I lead our team um, in computer vision, machine learning, analytics efforts. Thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, Bernardo. 
Hi all, I'm Bernardo. I'm a PhD student at the IDSS of MIT. I work with professors Munser Dale and Annette Hosoy. Uh, the problems we work on are more uh, the statistical properties of problems aimed at uh, estimating yield in agriculture. Thank you. Ignacio, you're muted. Ignacio, you're muted. Thank you. My name is Ignacio. I recently joined Indigo Agriculture. I come from the satellite imaging industry prior from Planet Labs. I lead the team who does essentially remote sensing architecture and operational models to try to support the monitoring of regenerative farming. Thank you so much. Alex. Hi everyone. I'm assistant professor at the University of Illinois working, I guess, broadly on computer vision and machine learning and very gladly affiliated with the AI Farms Institute where, I'm, where I am an assistant research director. Thank you. Jim. Hello, I'm Jim. Uh, I'm leading the engineering team here at Mineral. Mineral is a project in Google X. Uh, we been here around for about four and a half years, actually five years, and now we can finally go public. I'm really happy to participate in this uh, conversation and uh, help uh, talk with each other. Thank you. Shi. Hi, I'm Shi Yi Pekrol. I'm the chief data scientist from Swarm Engineering. Swarm Engineering is a software as a service uh, solution provider. We provide a local no code solution to food, um, agriculture, and logistic industries. Ranveer. <laughs> yeah, hi, Ranveer Chandra. I'm the CTO for Ag and Food at Microsoft. I started the Farm Beats project and uh, excited to see all the work happening here. Thanks, Naira and team. Thank you, Ranveer. Ed. Um, hi, I'm Ed Delp. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering and biomedical engineering at Purdue. I, I work on a lot of problems having to do with image processing, computer vision. I've been working on um, ag-related problems for about four or five years now. Thank you. Melba. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, at least afternoon here in uh, the, the East Coast time zone. Uh, I'm from Purdue University, and I work at the interface of machine learning and remote sensing. Uh, my expertise is in multimodality sensing, um, hyperspectral RGB LIDAR, and uh, I've been involved with two large projects that I think interface a lot with um, what's been talked about here. One is um, a very large phenotyping project that was funded called Terra um, by the Department of Energy, and most recently a new ERC that is related to precision ag with new sensing uh, modalities and uh, machine learning. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your contribution and staying so long in this workshop since this morning. So let's go over the questions that you presented. So for me to do a brief introduction. Uh, so we're in the field of digital agriculture and this workshop touched upon different uh, aspects of it, starting from robotic technology that involves different sensing, sensor sensing modalities, image processing, decision making, and how we can get the best uh, quality food on our table. So from farm to table and all the challenging aspects of it, the, the data coming from satellites to fine sensing on uh, different robotic technologies uh, under the canopy, on the top of canopy and so on. So what are the greatest opportunities and challenges what we have experienced over the last decades? A, a digital agriculture is a relatively junior industry. We can't compare it to aerospace industry or say to medical industry that are uh, much more mature uh, from various considerations. So uh, let's agree that if you want to express an opinion, you raise your hand, I mean, the way we manage this Zoom, or you just go ahead and talk so that we do not interrupt each other. If somebody starts talking, then we see hand raised, right? So let's get started. <laughs> Uh, who wants to talk first? <laughs> I, I mean, maybe I can say something. Okay, get started. Okay, Ignacio, go ahead. Possibly. Um, I think one of the topics we're trying to bring up in our talk is the, the gap of actually digital data sets to capture what's going on in the farm. And curious about is 
you know, information is power, it's economic power. It helps you build better products and position your businesses you know, to make more money. How, how do we overcome the fact that this information has commercial value and is today guaranteed to essentially not really be open to everybody? Like a lot of the relevant data sets that are sitting around are gonna be controlled by you know, the people who collect those data sets. And, and they're gonna constitute the best training data sets to do machine learning modeling and so on. So how do we overcome, you know, this digital commons kind of need that put a, you know, interoperable collection of data sets that are available to everybody, given that this data is worth money, probably? Uh, who wants to respond? So I can jump in a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this question. And actually, I think this is a very important question. Uh, we actually been uh, navigating through this data space for uh, quite a while, and uh, really believe that uh, there's big opportunity for the egg industry or and ac academics all coming together with some sort of common understanding of how much we can get that, uh, how we can get data, and how we can actually make data interoperable. I, I think that, that that is a big question, and uh, everyone probably has his and her own data bank, and uh, nobody else really have a one fit for everything solution, right? So, so I my uh, thing is really is there's big opportunity for all of us to collaborate and uh, having some common standard, provide some data quality standard, provide some interoperability standard, so that everyone actually can build an open platform for everyone to participate. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Bernardo. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there's also, um, uh, well, it, it, based on the experience in our group, there are also uh, other solutions we have tried. One is to also foster work uh, in academia that will allow to make estimations without relying on sensitive or more private information uh, that is not readily available for everyone. So, for example, if if we start working on a, on a statistical methodology, which will allow us to estimate uh, different effect of policies or the yield that does not rely on, for example, uh, private farmers data or, or individual level farming data, but can rely on some aggregated statistics that can be collected more, more easily for everyone. I think those methods can, can go a long way because then they can be used by other people in academia and, um, and no one needs to, to be able to access this information. And, and the, the other side is, um, that we have all also worked on is how to make uh, people own their data more. And I think that is more a, incentive, a mechanism design and also uh, is also related to, to law and regulation, but uh, making a framework that will allow farmers to own their, their data and to profit from it the most. Good. Chris, you have something to add? Yeah, that's a really great point on uh, kind of data ownership. Mm -hmm. I think as we're, we're going to see some more regulations coming um, that, that are going to, you know, put privacy of your data more in the, in the growers and the farmers control. And uh, I think that we can leverage that and, and offer kind of incentives for farmers to be, you know, part of these larger scale programs and, and help, uh, help people, uh, you know, like with, with more re university research and statistical uh, uh, algorithm development. Um, and I think that would, that would actually power that a lot. Um, in terms of like challenges and opportunities, I had a couple of thoughts I wanted to share with the group. Uh, labor, labor shortages are a really big problem for farmers, but it's also an opportunity for automation. So the, in the recent years, the labor shortage has actually gotten worse with uh, tightened immigration policies and COVID restrictions. And it's actually very tough for a farmer to, uh, to find skilled labor. You know, some of these machines, uh, a lot of these machines that the farmers operate are, you know, $750,000, million dollars is, is pretty common. And you need skilled labor to uh, run these, these machines to the field. And it's really hard to find that skilled labor. So this automation can actually help farmers do their jobs more efficiently. And I think it's a, a big opportunity for uh, AI and ag. Um, another point I wanted to make was that uh, I think explainability is really key. 
as machine learning scientists and AI scientists, we often think of, you know, how do I introspect my computer vision model, my CNN or my, my deep learning network? How do I understand why it's doing the thing that it does? Uh, and that's an important question for sure, but unfortunately it's only a very narrow slice of the thing we need to answer. Um, I'm, my perspective is kind of coming from a machine that's in the field, you know, uh, reacting to its environment, doing things. And we really need to be able to explain the why behind that. Like, why is it reacting in this way? So I, just a, a, a thing I want to say to this group is that the building this explainability in is a really big investment, but it's important for debugging system performance and customer adoption. Um, especially when you're working directly with farmers and growers, if, uh, if it looks like a magic black box that they don't know how it works, um, it's gonna be really hard for them to adopt it. And that's gonna, it's gonna make it tough to deploy the solution. So AI explainability is really a small subset. It's just a component of the larger system. We need to be able to explain the actions that our robots are taking uh, all the way from um, from inception to completion. So we, we need to have a great, great story built up around that. So Ranvier, you had a hand raised. Yeah, Naira, so I was just uh, responding earlier to some of the points which was around data sharing where there is some interesting developments happening in the cryptographic space. Mostly a lot of that work is uh, applicable in the financial services industry around how do you share data without how do you do AI on encrypted data, for example, uh, using techniques such as homomorphic encryption or mm -hmm. a confidential compute, which might be a platform that might allow uh, users to share data, especially in the agriculture space, it becomes even more important for different stakeholders to securely share data with one another. So there are some interesting developments happening. They're still a bit more expensive for broad adoption, but they might be they might ad address uh, some of the privacy problems in in agriculture. And I agree with Chris's point around explainability. I think this thing around being able to uh, say what's happening uh, or with AI, it's it's important. And also issues around uh, uh, removing bias and fairness in AI. I think all of that is very important for agriculture as well. That is, we don't want farmers to suffer because of some decisions that we've made based training on data that didn't quite represent what uh, their, their particular field or their particular farming practices. But I think it's all early in this space and uh, it's great that we are all at least discussing it and taking it into account as opposed to some of the other industries where we are further ahead and now we are having to think about a lot of these problems. Exactly. Like what happened, for example, I mean, it's very um, kind of sometimes painful to draw the parallels between self-driving cars and drone industries. There are interesting parallels to do how the regulations in one case came before, in another case they came after and what uh, type of accidents they produced. But that's a different topic. We can talk about it when we workshop on drone and self-driving car industries. Uh, so Mason, you had something to say. I noticed your hand raised. Sure, yeah. Uh, just building on some of what, what others have talked about, I think there's an, one of the big challenges when we really start moving into all the crops that there are is, is the massive amount of variability that exists across crop. Within crop, there are many cultivars. Within those cultivars, they're within many environments, and then they're managed in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So by the time you subset all of those different sources of variation, uh, you end up with a really small market uh, if you develop a specific solution. And so I think that what, you, what a critical thing we want to think about, and I think a lot of people here are thinking about, is generalizability of the models and also um, thinking about the efficiency of the data. And I think that's something that uh, we, we, coming together, like Jim had mentioned, and thinking of ways we can share data um, is gonna be one of the key solutions. I think we talked a bit about this earlier, but synthetic data generation, I think is a big opportunity because we're in a pretty structured, we're, I'd say we fall into a semi-structured type of domain, right? And so this is a place where we know a lot about the biology and the underlying constraints. And when you're in a field, a vineyard, 
you can you can generally speaking know what the scene is going to look like, right? You're pretty constrained in that sense compared to a lot of other places. So I think we can build on that prior information and build that into the models and hopefully constrain the problem quite a bit as well. I see. More opinions? So let's move to the next question. Then. Uh, so Malba mm -hmm. is uh, raising so hand. Malba, right? I didn't see. Yeah, so um, certainly I think a, a lot of really important points have been made. I think explainability and trustworthiness are, are among, among the top ones. One of the things that I think that, um, that the AI Institute um, at the University of Illinois is doing is uh, that we need to watch is that they're trying to cross the great divide between agriculture and engineering and computer science. Um, we as people who are in engineering and computer science tend to be uh, on the side of give us your data and we'll analyze it. And we don't really understand the phenomena. And as we move toward uh, incorporating biophysical models, um, physics-based model, even the hydrology, then we, we really need to understand more. And I, I think this was a point that some of the previous speakers were also trying to, to get at um, in the invited talk. So I, I think this is, is really um, something we need to be thinking about if we wanna really be successful in more than a superficial way. So I want to move to the second question and here I'll, I will just do my brief intro. So when we started a few years ago, so the data that we were collecting was absolutely not suitable for application of any of the AI algorithms that we knew of, right, who is here. And now it seems that things move much faster. So either we just became more skilled or just uh, the collection of the data became more organized and easier to apply. So what are big changes that you all have observed over the last say one or two years, because we're in the field of kind of exponential technologies and it would be good to understand what are the big changes happening on a yearly basis? Who wants just to go first? Chris, I see hand raise. Is it a new hand raise or it's from the old? So- Oh, that's a new one, yeah. <laughs> okay, you want to talk or? Yeah, sure, I can, I can kick it off. This is a really interesting question to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that attitudes have shifted uh, towards uh, AI and farming is not 20 years out. Um, the, the growers and the farmers that we work with directly are increasingly feeling like, hey, you know, this is right around the corner and AI is going to help me with my farming operations in some ways that I can imagine and actually lots of ways that I probably can't imagine yet. I think that one of the things that has kind of driven this, especially from like the computer vision point of view, is that uh, companies like Tesla and Waymo have really proven that conduction, you know, commercial production scale computer vision can actually work. And these innovations and these successes are paving the way for successes in robotics and ag, in my opinion. So what's happened, I think, in the last few years, and, and we've seen this kind of evolve at, at our company, is when we would talk to farmers sort of three or four years ago, it, they thought we were talking about something that they were going to see in another decade or another two decades or something. But as, we, as we've been visiting them year over year, they're, they're starting to really understand, like, this is right around the corner, and computer vision and AI and robotics are going to have an impact on their on their farms, and it's it's actually going to be a near term impact, and not something that's uh, that's sort of science fictiony. So, I've definitely seen that attitudes have, sh have shifted a lot, and AI and farming is is really becoming a reality. So, kind of sea and spray in particular. Um, five years ago, I think folks kind of thought this was a kind of a crazy idea. Like, how could you possibly teach a computer to find all the weeds in my field? Um, but now they're actually seeing like it's just a matter of time, right? And, and we're building products that are going to hit the market. And I think that that's going to pave the way for adoption of uh, AI in agriculture. Alex, so I'm going by my screen. Alex, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I guess, wanted to particularly reiterate uh, Melba's and, and Chris's point and, and highlight it from a different view. Um, really, uh, I guess, educating people and helping them understand, um, you know, what, what are the, the impacts is, I, I think, a particularly important aspect here. And 
um, what time scales we are looking at. That this is not something uh, you know fifty years out. Uh, this is something that we're, if not themselves, at least you know impact impact their their, their children. And the other important aspect I think which we have seen in in, in AI farms is really this. Uh, ability of, of people to reach across different fields and, and really start talking to each other. Um, you know, I guess we, we saw that, I guess, when we when we wrote the proposal initially, CSC, CE people and, and ACT people and um, talking to each other, uh, the, even that though we speak English, but the <laughs> language is just different. <laughs> and and it, it took a lot of time you know, to, to reach that consensus. And I think that that is also something in the field that, that is, it is changing and is, is really helping us now move forward uh, much more efficiently than we used to before. Because we're speaking the same language and, and we don't have to constantly, I guess, interrupt each other and, and wonder about what, what are the different, um, I guess, aspects that people are talking about. So I, I guess I... I would summarize this as getting people to think more as data scientists and, and getting data scientists to think more in, in the domain are uh, two things that, are, uh, that I see gradually changing. Ranvier? Yeah, no, great points by Chris and Alex. The other thing I'll add are two more things. One is more of the uh, big ag and agricultural companies and governments as well, public sector are getting uh, aware of the benefits of data-driven agriculture, the benefits of data in agriculture, like, uh, and from our side as well. And the big companies as well, you see the tech companies, like what you're seeing in academia happen here as well. We see Mineral, we see Microsoft in this space and uh, others as well, right? So companies are seeing more that, you know, tech can come to agriculture. And the same thing with the agriculture companies you've heard about are announcement with Lander Lakes, with USDA and other uh, other organizations as well. So that's one thing which has happened in the last two years. The other thing that has happened in the last two years is, I think there is more of data sharing that is likely to happen. And it is driven by awareness around sustainability. That is, as you know, with the new administration and there is a lot of like a lot of organizations making their climate commitments Microsoft has said that we'll be carbon negative by 2030. Uh, many other companies have said that as well. And the way we are going to get there is part of it is through technology such as agriculture that can put carbon back in soil. The US government, Secretary Vilsack is proposing the carbon bank where farmers would be paid for using the right agricultural practices. Well, how do you know that the farmer is using the right agricultural practices? How do you verify that? So that could be a trigger to enable data sharing uh, which could lead to more open data, more data sets for researchers to start building much better models. So that's something which has happened in the last couple of years, more awareness around soil carbon around the, uh, and around how agriculture can play a role, which I think could be a trigger to drive more adoption of AI and computer vision techniques in agriculture. More opinions? Yes, she, go ahead. She, one thing I would like to add is the explosion of data in this field. I think with the cost of sensor, uh, different sensors going down, uh, if you think of the old days, the farmer knows what seed I'm growing, the yield at the end of the season and the climate throughout the season, that's pretty much what they have. Nowadays, we have all kinds of sensors on the ground, uh, in the air, and even on the equipment, then uh, the farmers are having an explosion of uh, different data and frequency of data, dimension of data. I think that's also propelling the, the agriculture industry to more embracing machine learning and AI because this volume of data is beyond human's uh, uh, comprehension or easy digestions. Okay, let's move to the ne next question, if no more opinions. So last year when COVID hit, lots of the industries suffered significantly because of the operations being constrained due to social uh, spacing, physical spacing and so on. However, agriculture was identified as one of the essential industries allowed to continue its operations because agriculture is what produces the food that people cannot live without it. 
So how did you experience the impact of COVID on agriculture, in particularly in your work? Who wants to talk here? Maybe I can jump in here? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So I think I have it is, in a certain way, it's an opportunity for us to I mean, rethink our strategies in agriculture. Mm -hmm. One thing is very clear from COVID world is really the shortage of labor mm -hmm. and the, the hardness of, of having all the labor in the field. Uh, I mean, it was already happening, but COVID just uh, accelerated the trend. We actually all know that today's, I mean, ML or AI technologies, the one biggest, the biggest disadvantage is actually the accuracy. Improving accuracy to a production level is actually a lot of engineering effort. If you look at big uh, auto driving companies, you will know improving the accuracy from 80% to 90% will actually probably uh, is 10 times effort. Improving to 90% to actually another say 99% is probably another 10x effort. So I think uh, the, the path to enable automation to really improve the perception model accuracy is going to be the challenge that everyone has to face going forward and it will pro take probably a lot of efforts. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you want to express opinion. I would like to add something there. Uh -huh. okay. okay. So you guys probably also heard during COVID, like the farms are, farmers are dumping uh, uh, potatoes and putting the onions back in the ground, whereas in the stores where some people don't have the money to put food on their plate. I think one of the challenge or what COVID exposes our end-to-end -end agriculture food supply chain is somehow very specialized or optimized for certain rigid ways, like the milk are packaged, the food are packaged for restaurants, but not cannot be flexibly changed to end consumers. I think that we have to rethink about this whole end-to-end -end supply chain. How do we make sure it's flexible enough? Uh, we don't waste food or can adapt to sudden changes. Yeah, that's certainly the impact of infodemics on food supply chains has been extensively discussed in different forums. And I've seen lots of articles on how the, yeah, this impact has influenced the food supply chains on its own. And uh, Jim, I would argue with you regarding this last 10%, 10 I think you were very generous, improving those accuracies when you hit already the 80, 90%, the process is highly nonlinear. From 80 to 90 and from 90 above, it's not just 10, 10. Yeah, I just don't want to scare people off, you know, so I, I think. <laughs> I think there already every person comes at the cost of blood, right? So it's, for every other percentage, you fight another five years to get, I don't know, another percentile of, I don't know, 100 or what. I, okay, let's not scare people. <laughs> let's not get there. Who wants to talk? Chris, did you have something? Somebody raised hand. Who wanted to say something? Oh, Chris, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really good point about the supply chain management. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen uh, a couple of startups now who are really focused around uh, ensuring that there's kind of a local supply chain. And so mm -hmm. what these businesses were sort of born out of COVID because what they, they found, like uh, I think one of the other presenters mentioned that uh, there was companies that were dumping their, their products because they couldn't transport them um, to the places that they were needed. And this has actually given birth to uh, some innovation in that, in that space. And so folks are building uh, greenhouses out in Gilroy. Uh, I'm in uh, Sunnyvale, California. And, uh, and there's uh, some, some companies are out there building greenhouses to ensure kind of that local supply chain. Um, Definitely on the COVID impact, yeah, plus one on the labor shortage. Mm -hmm. So part of this was caused by, you know, restricting uh, the border crossings and that's made a, a big problem for growers. Uh, that's just made it worse. Um, what we saw uh, actually at, at Kenna John Deere was like a, um, a hold on purchases of new equipment. So orders that had been placed sort of six months before the pandemic hit, those were, those were fine, but um, 
when folks are in an uncertain situation, they, you know, the tendency is not to, not to overspend, right? So a lot, a lot of farmers are in a, um, a low margin uh, growth, you know, that their, their operations are pretty low margin and they're, when, when there's an uncertainty there, there, the tendency is to hold on to the, hold on to their money and not, uh, not maybe do the purchases that, uh, that they saw. So we, we definitely uh, saw a lot of that um, kind of during the pandemic. Ravia, did you want to say something? I saw your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly mention, I mentioned it in my talk, but there were a few things we did with uh, Purdue University around COVID, which was uh, like one was with Professor Jason Lusk, I briefly mentioned that, which was basically a dashboard for supply chain visibility. Where you could see which crop is at risk. So the way we did that was we took data sets, open data sets from different sources like COVID data sets, Mm -hmm. uh, data sets from USD and other sources on what's grown where and came up with this risk metric which we published a paper and we created a dashboard so that you can click on a commodity say chicken or corn or peas and then say a county and look mm -hmm. at what is the risk for that particular commodity in that county this we then uh, Professor Lusk applied for a FAR grant he's got a FAR matching grant on it as mm -hmm. well and he's continuing that work so that's one of the things we're doing the other thing we did was the thing what Chris was mentioning on closing, like uh, making, uh, enabling smallholder farmers to sell directly to consumers. So instead mm -hmm. of directly con connecting smallholder farmers to consumers, we created a dashboard for farmer market makers. These are people who run farmers markets to help mm -hmm. farmers connect to consumers. This was again, done work done with Purdue University in that area. So there were some of the things we, we have been doing, but uh, the key, one of the key things we realize is we need to make the supply chain much more visible, much more transparent, which means again, data sharing, being able to bring diversity of data sets in one place, including mm -hmm. computer vision data, IoT data, other data sets, and then applying AI to start making predictions. Like in, with the dashboard, we were able to flag that a particular meat packing plant in Yakima, Washington was going to close a week before it actually shut down. So these are the kind of things which could help the supply chain be more resilient than what we've experienced over the last year. Melba. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, address this from a, another point of view. Um, one of the impacts in an unexpected way was a dramatic increase in the number of publications. Uh, people that were, and I know because I'm involved with IEEE Explore, and so the number of publications went up. Now, of course, that's a short-term outcome from previously funded research. Um, and so down the road, we're going to, you know, see the longer-term impact associated with funding, although at this point, it, uh, there are lots of opportunities. But a, a bigger impact, at least to those in academia, is related to the, the student population. You know, there was a big disruption last year. And so, uh, and because of the re reduction and, and actually almost termination of visas that were allowed for students that come into our programs from China, from India, from Europe, et cetera, then uh, a lot of programs have been really impacted and we're just going to start seeing that soon. So I think that, you know, that's just something to, to point out. Um, and on the research end of things, um, you know, Chris pointed out the, the hardware end of things from, from John Deere's point of view, but from the plant breeders point of view, then all of their international nurseries were also impacted. Um, you know, I have a project in Hyderabad and Corteva can't go there, Simit is not able to operate. So you lose multiple generations of work in terms of the plant breeding. So I think it's going to be a long-term impact that we're going to be seeing. Bernardo. Uh, um, uh, the impact that uh, I have uh, I have seen or we have seen in our group, we we're also working on the impact of COVID in employment, and definitely uh, in many countries the the employment rate went low, especially for for people working in in low skill sector, and uh, speaking to to some people, I'm from Mexico, and speaking to some people in smaller towns in Mexico, what wind up happening is that they went back to subsistence agriculture. Uh, so luckily some people could go back to uh, lost their jobs could go back to farming but um, the problem with that is that um, that we have studied is that in subsistence agriculture the stakes for innovation are really high and uh, as Chris was mentioning uh, if it's a time for crisis then people 
do not want to to put their to put a lot of money into into growth or change because uh, with stakes so high, if something goes wrong, then um, then you, you will lose more than just uh, your your additional money, and you can lose your subsistence. Uh, so and and that is also related to to the fact that the food uh, supply chain was also super disrupted uh, in the U.S. but also in Mexico and in many other countries. So I think uh, I, I I will look up in, into the work uh, Ranveer is mentioning because I think that could be very useful for big and also for small players uh, around the world. Ed, anything you want to add? Yeah, I I would like to ask it maybe something in a little bit different vein, but sort of related to this problem. Um, and that is about two weeks ago, I had an interesting conversation with a, with a farmer uh, who, who farms about, oh, it's, it's about 30 miles north of where we are here in West Lafayette, Indiana. And, um, you know, he was, uh, it, it's a relatively large family farm. Uh, everybody, all his children, his wife, everybody works in it. And, um, he was bemoaning this concept that a lot of farmers are worried about this issue about right to repair. That, you know, he, he makes the argument that he's losing, he's losing control over a, a lot of things that go on in this farm. He's losing control on what he can do with his seed because he's buying it from a seed company that puts certain controls on it. He's worried about also the ability to take care of his own equipment and then he's, he even mentioned, okay, I explained to him some of the stuff we're doing. And, and, and there was also the issue is, okay, am I going to lose control all, over all this other data? Now, I think somebody, I, I forget who it was mentioned, there might be some new rules about what farmers own and what farmers don't um, as far as their own data. But I think this is also going to be a problem about, well, who's going to control all this data? And when you say the farmer has, has the right to all of this information, you know, how's that really going to shake out as we, we move forward? You know, we had lots of problems and we still have problems in the U.S. about healthcare data. In HIPAA, uh, which would, you know, the, the law that supposedly controls this uh, still hasn't done a very good job about that. And so I, I wonder if, you know, we should be worried about that, you know, those of us that are working and applying to uh, applying even more uh, technological uh, advances to agriculture. Uh, should we should we worry about that? And has anybody else had these discussions with farmers? So, well, let's see if other companies had these discussions with farmers. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting point. Ed, uh, the I think the experience I've had is kind of uh, looking at the GDPR rules specifically, which. Uh, give the, the person who owns the data actually a lot of control over it. So it's part of the GDPR, uh, you know, if, and especially if you're a company kind of working in Europe, you know, you have to be, uh, you have to have systems implemented. So as a, a person who's giving data over to somebody else to do something with, um, you're sort of giving authorization or not uh, to, to the company to have that data, but you can also kind of revoke uh, that authorization kind of at any time and you you are allowed to kind of interrogate the, the company and say hey you know where's my data what are you doing with it right but so, that's not true in the US now that's true yeah that's correct um, yeah I think California is uh, is starting to adopt some more of that so we'll, we'll kind of have to see wait and see how far that goes but yeah I would say like Europe's kind of got like the ultimate uh, maybe maybe not quite the ultimate but certainly uh, a lot stricter data for, uh, restrictions than, um, than the U.S. currently does. So we'll have to see how the, yeah. how the new administration- You know, as, as an academic doing work in this area, looking at applying, you know, computer vision image analysis uh, to s several of these types of data sets, of course, we want more and more data, but I have found this to be a very refreshing conversation to have this with a, with a farmer who's a very modern farmer. He's flying drones over his fields and, uh, collecting some of his own data, but he's, you know, worried about other things. And, uh, you know, he was uh, bemoaning the fact he had bought a brand new planter and it was sitting there in his uh, barn waiting for the, uh, uh, it wasn't John Deere, it was the other company to show up and do all the activation on the device so he could get it operational, you know, and he was bemoaning to me, he couldn't even, you know, get in there and drive it around until all the software got activated. 
So um, I'm just saying it, you, you know, there might be a pushback, maybe not so much for sort of uh, industrial agriculture, but, you know, some of these, when we have a, uh, in, 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 the, in the Midwest, and I, I know a little bit more about Indiana and Melbourne knows a lot more about the Midwest, you know, there is a lot of large family farms, and I think they are, they are beginning to worry about these types of things. Ranvir, what do you have to say? Yeah, no, this is a very interesting question, right, around who owns the data. And there's some very interesting business models as well coming up at, uh, at where there are some companies that are paying farmers for sharing data. Yeah. Um, and there are other, there's some other work which is talking about the value of data. That is, can you pay them rather than a flat amount, which is what some companies are doing, saying, we'll give you uh, $2 an acre or something like that, to giving them, uh, the, paying them based on the amount of value that their data generates uh, or the fidelity of the data. So there are some interesting business models coming up as well. At Microsoft, we are not going to be owning the data. We've made it very clear that we're building a platform for other ag tech companies. So it's the relationship between the ag tech companies and the farmer. But this, we are just providing the hooks to make sure you can securely share whatever data is needed. But this this particular question, I think it's a it's a research question as well, which we pose to the people in the crypto community in particular, saying, how do you securely share share this data? And the interesting thing about agriculture is that there's some amount of data that can just be learned from remote sensing, for example, from satellites, from weather stations, from uh, aerial vehicles. You can learn some of this data, which can be sub, which makes it harder to obscure some of the data that farmers might want to obscure. Yeah. But that so, said, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just gonna say, I, I do a lot of work on the data security side. And just, you mentioned homomorphic encryption. Uh, Google just open sourced a bunch of really nice homomorphic encryption tools. Uh, that happened like two or three days ago. And there's some of the, some, they're very good. And, uh, so you know that might be that might be one approach, although sometimes that does cause constraints. But um, you know, I I think this is going to, and I think we see analogies to this, um, you know, in the medical area, and also even in autonomous driving. Um, you know, I happen to own a Tesla, and I have to admit to you, I don't know what the hell it's doing with my data. Okay, all I know was if I wanted to get software updates. I have to, I had to agree to the data sharing plan. Okay. Which, you know, the, the, I'm sure the car is, you know, sending lots and lots of stuff back to, uh, back to Elon Musk, but you know, that, that's a model I hope doesn't go forward in, 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 uh, in ag. Yeah, I think we need to raise more awareness on the pros and cons of this. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the next question I want to raise here because um, this year we have representatives here from uh, NSF AI Institute and uh, we see that the US government starts investing more and more in AI research. So this becomes very important and takes central stage in all our research portfolios. We saw also that C3 DTI Digital Transformation Institute starts investing in climate change, Elon Musk that you just mentioned came up with 100 million prize for uh, whoever solves the global warming problem. And I, I got one of the recent C3 AI awards for climate change uh, where we proposed uh, for carbon sequestration, intelligent farming solutions. So we have here Alex Schwing representing University of Illinois and Mason, are you still here? I, I just- Yep, I'm still here. So yeah. Mason representing uh, UC Davis. So I, I want to see uh, what are uh, every, what are everybody's expectations from having this type of institute growing in the country. And uh, if maybe we could briefly hear Alex and Mason to present a quick overview of their institutes, of the thrust, because they both have different kind of angles of exploring uh, the AI benefits for digital agriculture. I know more about University of Illinois, less about UC Davis. So we could hear maybe them just go in turns, guys, the way you want, and then we'll see how others comment here, okay? Alex, sure. you... mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't mind, Mason, I go first because I actually, I'm supposed to show up in another panel like one minute ago. 
<laughs> try to uh, briefly answer that question. Mm -hmm. So um, let me, I guess, uh, briefly talk about the research thrust that we have at uh, University of Illinois in the AI Farms Institute. And uh, we have about 40 people. And uh, as Melba and others mentioned earlier, they kind of spread around CS, ECE, as well as the ag domain. Um, and I think one of the really interesting aspects um, that this allowed um, is really for people from different areas to start talking together. And as I mentioned before, I think that that is one of the really uh, most transformative impacts that, that, that this had so far. In terms of the research thrusts, um, we divided it into, uh, I guess, six re research thrusts that we think are really important. Um, autonomy is, is one of them that has been mentioned by multiple people before, um, related to the, the labor shortage, but also uh, related to precision agriculture, for instance. And so um, one of our important thrusts here is really, you know, how do we get autonomous farming um, in, into the real world? A second one um, talks about livestock systems. And there we mentioned the, I guess, labor shortages um, earlier. Um, you know, we want to treat animals well, um, but we have fewer and fewer, fewer people helping in that area. Um, so how can we, to some extent, automate this process and, and help, help the farmers uh, get um, the help they need? Um, a third thrust is really environmental resilience. And uh, I mean, climate change, I would argue, is one of the biggest problems uh, that we really have to deal with. And uh, we don't have a lot of time left. And I think um, in the act domain, we have... Uh, a lot of opportunities. Uh, I mentioned precision agriculture before, um, but there are many, uh, many others as well. And so environmental resilience is, is the third thrust. Um, fourth one, soil monitoring. Um, how, how can we treat, um, I guess, the planet that we're living on um, adequately? Um, how do we know what to plant, when to plant, uh, forecasting? That, that's the fourth thrust. And so while these four thrusts are mostly on the research side, um, I think, and I alluded to that earlier in my comment, um, getting the technology adopted is an important aspect as well. So we actually have explicitly a fifth thrust, which um, uh, talks to um, farmers and, and tries to understand what, what do they need? What are their, their needs? And, and how can their needs then feed into the research thrusts? Um, so technology adoption is our fifth research thrust. And then the, the last point, uh, but I would argue equally important to the other ones is really education and outreach. Um, I mentioned that before as well. Um, we need uh, people to uh, not only use the technology, but also understand the technology. And, and not only in the US, but, but across the world. Um, and in some places, um, they might have much, these technologies might have a much bigger impact than, than in the US. So helping people understand what, how, and uh, where we are using this technology is an important aspect. So I would argue education and outreach equally important. So I guess wrapping it up, uh, 40 people across six thrusts uh, discussing autonomous farming, livestock systems, environmental resilience, soil monitoring, technology adoption, and education and outreach are um, the uh, key points that we're trying to push. Thank you, Alex. And you can leave, I saw your message, so you have to leave for another panel. Thank you very much. All right. and Thanks for having me here. Him. Apologies. Clear, sure. Mason, so just briefly describe your institute and we'll see how to quickly wrap. Everybody has been here for quite long. Sure, I will try, I'll try to keep it short, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm representing UC Davis led AI Institute for Next Generation Food Systems, but it's a group from UC Davis, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, Cornell, we actually have some U of I, uh, UC people as well, along with USDA, uh, ARS, and then the UCANR, which is our Ag and Natural Resource uh, Experimental Group. So the primary 
mission of, of our institute is to empower the next generation to produce and distribute sustainable, nutritious food with your resources. And that's through transformative AI technology. So we've organized this in a way that's maybe a little different um, from, from the U of I project in that we've looked kind of across the supply chain uh, because we, we tend to have, so at UC Davis and at our partnering institutes, we have a lot of people focusing across the food supply chain. So we've broken this down into four applied research areas, one being the molecular breeding group. So that's one of our clusters. We have then agricultural production, food processing and distribution and nutrition. And so we have these four applied research areas and then we have these cross cutting foundational areas of AI and also socioeconomics and ethics. And so those, the idea is to kind of find the intersection across that food supply chain. So a lot of the projects that we've done in this first year are actually going out and saying, all right, everybody, let's, let's figure out the, the kind of interesting research projects we have. And one of the requirements is that you cut across multiple application areas, and you also have to interface with both the socioeconomics and AI uh, team. So the first step we're in, we're in kind of our identity building phase, right? So we know what it, we said in the grant proposal, but now it's saying, okay, first let's do this. And then the next step, we've got this industrial and productization kind of branch that's looking to collaborate with industry and find what our role is in that process. And we see ourselves as, as kind of the, the research, the higher, the early phase research, but we know there's a lot going on in industry as well. So we know there's a, there's a big need to be able to interface there and figure out the right way to connect. And then finally, we've also got the education and outreach portion, um, which again is, is critical. So we've got a lot going on all the way locally with uh, some, some local food oriented organizations to kind of larger scale ones, thinking about building open data platforms for agriculture more generally. Thank you so much, right? We have to emphasize education because we have so many industries sitting around this room just who are looking to hire our students, right? Uh, Ramir, you raise the hand, so you have something to add. Oh, sorry, this is a stale hand. Uh, ah, this is the... But yeah, I'm very excited about it. But I'm very excited about the work the AI institutes are doing. I've had uh, quite a bit of chat with uh, the University of Illinois uh, Institute, the initial conversations with UC Davis, but I think there is a lot of exciting things happening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So somebody willing to comment? I'll just mention, you know, on the education front, I think, you know, something as I've talked to students, given different talks, um, presentations and that, I think one of the just the really compelling things, and I think for the people um, in industry to understand kind of like who, you know, who, who are the people that are going to be kind of hired to push these, um, you know, next set of models into production and really kind of make change on the industry front. And then on the academic front, just, you know, kind of further understanding, like, you know, what, how to reach students with, you know, on, on the, the educational programming. Um, just one thing that just continues to, to compel me is just how um, uh, excited students seem to be about machine learning and ag, um, you know, and, and particularly as, as more and more the workforce becomes, um, you know, millennial and Gen Z, you know, people want to work on projects that are meaningful. Um, they don't want to sell ads. Um, you know, they, you know, they put spend a lot of time, you know, doing their PhD and, you know, it, it's fine. Maybe it's their first job, but like, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, come and say like, I'm just, I'm, I want to work on this. This is important to me. Um, and, and I see where it's at now. Um, but I also like, I think, you know, in, you know, you know, a lot of this, you know, U.S. focus, but then, um, you know, I have, I have family who, you know, they, they farm back in, in India or in Africa or in places that have different problems with an ag. And I'm just really committed to seeing this change. And I think, um, you know, there's a, there's an excitement there that, um, you know, that, that really possesses a lot of, a lot of opportunity. Um, so I think it's, it's great to have this kind of, you know, overlap there because um, people are very interested in that. Um, you know, one of the reasons we released some of our, our data sets, like the one project in particular, like it's, you know, um, I think it's just great ways of getting students, just like the challenge here, like excited about it and see what, what a difference you can make, see, you know, the work that you're doing actually making um, really exciting, tangible, impacting, you know, impactful work. Um, I think, I think um, particularly again, the um, you know, next, next wave of, of hires coming in and the students out there right now, they're just really, um, really excited about doing something meaningful. So it's an exciting area to be in. Ignacio, I see your hand. Thank you, Jennifer. Ignacio, your hand. Anything you want to say? You're muted. Yes, I'm always muted. 
So I think this is very interesting to me. It's like, how can we influence how we train the next generation of contributors? And generally what I want to point out, the gap I see when I've been trying to form things in the space is there's a big imbalance between the skills uh, that the students come with and the nature of the problem. So I'm relatively new to procedural culture, but it seems to me there's a lot of systems engineering and operations research aspects to the problems that we're trying to solve. And so the ability for professionals who enter the space to be prepared to operationalize scientific knowledge trumps the ability to derive new algorithms or implement them on small scale. Because these are all problems that can only be solved at scale and at the system level. So I see very big gaps in things like you know, systems engineering, advanced linear algebra, operations, research, optimization, but that is not AI and machine learning that ends up making the biggest impact I think in practice in a commercial operational setting is the ability to operationalize the scientific knowledge. And we need to train for that. It requires heavy advanced level of coursework. It's not, it's not the kind of thing you want to be teaching on the job. So, so I think we that's a worthy topic of conversation if you have the responsibility of shaping the curriculums of professionals who will enter in the space otherwise it will lead to disappointment they're not going to be able to contribute i'll just tell you that we at illinois we just designed the master's degree program program we call it cs plus cs crop sciences plus computer sciences and I was the chair of the curriculum uh, design and uh, I just approved it <laughs> a few weeks ago. So and it, and it's, it's a challenge, I'll tell you, how to design this curriculum so that at least by the end of the master's degree, the students would be capable of understanding the multiple dimensions of being efficient while working in these interdisciplinary domains of um, science and engineering and being productive while joining industries like yours or bigger industries or smaller startups and being productive and efficient on different time scales, right? Sometimes you have just to be able to produce something on a three months time scale, sometimes on the three years, right? And it's a cost function, <laughs> how to learn the cost function and how to write it up, right? So, so let's finally to get, um, uh, to the last question, and um, what can the government do, right, maybe, uh, to help uh, all of you? What type of policies we need to do, say, if, if you were to testify to the Congress, uh, what would be your wish to say, uh, to pitch to U.S. President, say, I wish you had revised the policies uh, for science, education, research, and uh, this would help us to be more efficient, to be more productive. So who would like uh, to go first? And with that, we'll wrap up, just if you have some final words also, just add it to your comment. Uh, Chris, you want to start? I see your hand. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> real real softball question there, Nara. That was a, that's a good one. Uh, I think what I would say is uh, definitely uh, having Having us our research focus a little bit more on applied stuff would would help us a lot. So just kind of as an example, um, you know, getting the highest score on cityscapes sort of doesn't move the needle on any problems that that we need to solve in ag. We need big data sets, uh, you know, semantic segmentation data set geared toward weed species identification that would drive a lot of uh, um, a lot of innovation in that space. I uh, love the the agricultural vision data set. That's perfect. You know, we just need like ten of those, or twenty of those, or or even more. So I'd love to see some more uh, funding to build these data sets and spur this innovation. That's kind of what I would say for sure. Um, as a closing comment here, I really liked the uh, discussion of the domain gap. So we have a, you know, we talk about domain gap usually as synthetic versus real data, but I was thinking as we were talking here, uh, you know, we, we're computer scientists and machine learning people and we're working with farmers and growers and there's a domain gap there. We have to solve that domain gap. And one of the ways that we solve that is we have a saying at the office that learning occurs in the field, not on the whiteboard. 
And what that means is that you gotta go and get your, get your boots dirty in the field, talk to growers, build empathy for their problem. And so you can really understand what they're struggling with because as soon as you get to the field, all your assumptions um, usually blow up. So we, we say that, uh, that that's kind of our approach for the domain gap, and I think it's a really powerful one. Um, I also wanted to, um, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, robotics and control is a really important part of, uh, of the domain too, and we need to really focus a lot of research on that too. Um, I think that's a really important uh, point going forward. Um, I really wanted to hit Jen's point too on uh, folks wanting to work on meaningful problems. I see that all the time, and, and that's one of the things that, uh, that helps us in our recruiting when we're recruiting folks who are maybe looking at, at, uh, at different companies and they see something really tangible in ag that they can make a difference and be part of something that's bigger than themselves. So to the extent that we can help harness that and give people opportunities, uh, co-ops, industry co-ops and internships and, and all those industry um, research partnerships, you know, I think that that's really key to uh, harnessing and, and getting our best and brightest minds on this problem. Exactly, right? When you say you get into the field and the assumptions blow away, I know what you mean. That's what in Boeing they say, the reality is always right. <laughs> or otherwise they say, <laughs> hardware keeps you honest, right? So you get out and hardware keeps you honest. So you just can't, there's no cheating, no shortcuts, right? Thank you very much for the compliments for agriculture vision set. So we started producing it. Thank you, Hongui, for leading that effort for us. So it's very encouraging to see that it has been useful for others as well. Ranveer, I see your hand raised. So let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, so I would agree with uh, Chris's point and uh, mm -hmm. congratulations again on the data set. I think it's great and look forward that, to, that you could keep it updated. I think that's a great initiative. We need more of those initiatives. In, uh, in agriculture. One of most recently I was in a National Academies panel on soil and I was bringing up this, this point of the Ag Vision data set, something similar for a soil data set as well. Mm -hmm. So you're leading the way with this data set and I think more and more of it is needed for agriculture. So the other thing I wanted to mention, your question was what would we tell uh, President Biden and the government? Okay, what, what all do we need to really enable the future mm -hmm. of uh, say a data-driven agriculture future. I think one of the things which I am very passionate about is connectivity. That is without mm -hmm. internet access in the farms, everything we are talking about would be very limited in scope. We won't really see the adoption of all of these unless we can get broadband to mm -hmm. rural America and not just to the households, but to the middle of the farm because we are talking of devices, drones, tractors, everything connected to the internet and we need good broadband connectivity. Part of it is technology, but a big part of it is policy as well. So and they, having the government adopt the right policies for the, adopt, for the adoption of broadband in rural America, I think that would be one. And the other one would be around subsidies. So this is one thing we talk about, not just to the government here, but also in the emerging markets. When we talk to them, we talk about, uh, like the governments give out subsidies for things like irrigation systems or modernizing the farm equipment, they should give out subsidies for digital agriculture. I think that would significantly help cross the price barrier and affordability barrier to enable the adoption of digital agriculture here in the US, but also worldwide. Exactly, we need to make sure the stereo bots work everywhere in the farms, right? I call it stereo bot, all these robotic devices everywhere connected with each other. It's a cool name to you. So more opinions here, I would like to hear others talking. Jim, you unmuted yourself, I see. Sure. Uh, so I can quickly uh, say something. I, I mm -hmm. totally agree with Chris and uh, uh, Ranvia. I mm -hmm. think uh, one thing uh, I I view as a very very cumbersome for all of us probably is grant data. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that government can play a bigger role in providing some sort of grant at large scale. Uh, mm -hmm. USDA actually previously actually pre prohibited you know field boundary of this data mm -hmm. to be shared across the board, right? So that actually creates a lot of problem for all of us, I think. So I, I do believe that the government can play a bigger role to share some mm -hmm. data, create some bigger data set for the industry mm -hmm. to move forward. On the other hand, the government can create a lot of incentive to adopt new practices, right? Uh, like uh, the, you know, the, the climate change. So how, mm -hmm. how you can put soil carbon back into the soil, right? So, 
Uh, I think th these areas government can really do um, service to all of us. On the other hand, the so government can also do, I mean, sometimes can can cause a little, little trouble for a lot of us in operating old model. But uh, I think that's, that's really an, I would say, interface between all of us and the working with government to understand what's the incentive and what's the disincentive to, to align the all of us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Ignacio? I really wanted to second the Jim's point on data sets that I would say are the geospatial commons of what we do, like field boundaries, data set of, like that, I think. But there are some things we can do in the industry ourselves, right? That there, is, there is an area where we could collaborate with each other possibly and create, you know, essentially third party consortia to essentially source together, you know, global or continental data sets, for example, for field boundaries. So we can have governmental action, but we can also have quasi-governmental action in the industry, right? By creating efforts that we do together and partnerships. So I will be very excited to hear people that want to work, work together on essentially common line units that are derived from computer vision and serve to the community as a geospatial commons. Thank you, thank you, Ignacio. More opinions? Who wants to talk? So if no more opinions, maybe we're right at an hour. We started, I think, at 12.42 here in Central. I want to thank all of you for your participation and involvement. So data decision-making, analytics, so optimization, and uh, everybody's involvement, talent, hard work are critical for making an impact in this important field that's going to feed the 7 billion, 9 billion. And the future generations, and most importantly, to train the junior generation in interdisciplinary mindset and make sure that they understand how to write the cost functions, the cost function on the piece of paper, the cost function of their life, to have the right balance between everything. Um, I think we can keep uh, in touch, stay in touch, and uh, we'll have the emails for exchange of ideas thoughts. This Zoom session was recorded and Hong Kui will post it online. Share the LinkedIn post uh, to, to have the broadest possible outreach. Ranveer, one more time, thank you for the keynote. And thank you everyone for your contributions, recorded videos, slides, posters, all the ideas. If you have some final thoughts, you're welcome to express yourself. If not, I want to thank you and wish all of you a good Sunday today. Um, Thanks a lot for organizing. Awesome, awesome workshop. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was very good. Thank you so yeah. much. Great panel. Yeah. Hopefully see you guys next year. Next year, by all means, yeah. with more sponsors and more people presenting, more companies, more universities being added. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thanks.